Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Eastern Area Planning Committee, which is one of three area based planning committees of Dorset Council. Our area of remit covers the previous Purbeck District Council and most of the previous East Dorset District Council areas. For the benefit of the public, I'm Councillor Tony Coombs and I'm Chairman of this Area Planning Committee. I would now like to introduce the officer support that we have today. Kim Cowell, Principal Planning Officer. Naomi Shinkins, Planning Case Officer. Liz Adams, Planning Case Officer. Neil Turner from Dorset Highways. Steve Savage from Dorset Highways. Chelsea Goddard, who will be reading out the public representations. Laura Autry is our solicitor and David Northover, our committee support officer. I would also like to thank all the officers behind the scenes who are making today's virtual meeting possible. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the council has had to put in place measures to enable the council's decision-making processes to continue whilst keeping safe members of the public, councillors and council staff in accordance with the government's guidance on social distancing by applying new regulations for holding committee meetings from remote locations. This meeting is being live streamed to the public and a copy of the recording of the meeting will be available on the website after the meeting. Public participation will take the form of written statements to the committee and we will be following the agenda as set out in the pack. So the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies, David Northover, please? I mean, I haven't received any apologies for this meeting. OK, thank you. So I will go through a roll call of the committee members just to confirm that everyone is here. Uh, for the members of the public, uh, members of the committee have their microphones and video switched off to improve the uh, quality of the streaming unless they wish to speak. But it's not necessary for the roll call. So first up, Shane Bartlett, Vice Chairman. Present, Madam Chairman. Alex Brenton. Present, Madam Chairman. Robin Cook. Present, Madam Chairman. Mike Dyer. Present, Madam Chair. Barry Gorringe. Present, Madam Chairman. Brian Heatley. Um, good morning, I'm here. David Morgan. Present, Madam Chairman. Julie Robertson. Present, Madam Chairman. David Took. Present, Madam Chairman. Bill Trite. Present, Madam Chairman. John Worth. Present, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. That's a full house and good morning to you all. Uh, the next thing I have to do is ask if there are any declarations of a pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination from members of the committee. Okay. If something does become apparent during the meeting, please then flag it up as soon as you're aware of that uh, conflict. The minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of December, uh, are members happy to approve them as a true record of that meeting and that I will sign them as soon as I can access offices? Yes, Madam Chairman. Uh, agreed, yeah. Chairman. Agreed, Madam Chairman. Agreed. Any? Madam Chairman. Agreed. 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 Thank you all very much. <laughs> OK. Moving on, public participation. Members of the public have been invited to submit written representations which are limited to 450 words. Members of Dorset Council who are not members of the committee and who wish to address the committee will be allowed to speak to the committee direct. All requests have to be registered with Democratic Services by 8.30 a.m. on Monday the 4th of January. Are there any representations from the public that do not relate to matters on the agenda today? None received, Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, so we have three planning applications before us today. Have there been any requests for deferrals or withdrawals, please? Good morning, Chairman. Kim Cowell here. No, there have been no requests for deferrals or withdrawals from today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so the background information relating to the applications before us today has been available for inspection by members prior to the meeting, and that covers consultations, objections, representations, as well as the East Dorset and Purbeck local plans and the Council's related policies. 
In each case, I will invite the case officer to introduce their item. Members of the public, planning agents, applicants and town and parish councils have been invited to make written submissions and these will be read out by Chelsea College, who has not been involved with the merits of any of the applications, but only in providing technical support. The representations will be read out in the following order. Public against the application, public in support of the application, the applicant or agent, the town or parish council, and then local member. Following the public participation section of every item, I will ask officers if there are any salient points that they wish to clarify. I will then uh, move on to the member debate. And in order to, to run the meeting efficiently, can I request that members of the committee direct any remarks and questions through the chair, and I will invite members to speak in turn. Requests to speak need to be made via the chat facility. And can I remind members that the chat facility is only for the running of the meeting and not to express any opinion on the um, merits of any application. At the end of the debate on an application, uh, I will take the, rote, the vote by roll call and the vote will be a recorded vote in the minutes if three or more members make the necessary request. I will also ask members to confirm that they have heard the entire presentation and debate before they cast their vote. So we will now move on to the first of our applications, agenda item five, 319-2437 reserved matters, details for 312 dwellings, public open space, vehicular, cycle and pedestrian access, connections to the SANG, which is a suitable area of natural green space, landscape planting and surface water attenuation features at land west of Cranbourne Road, Wimble Minster. And that is pages 15 to 98 on the agenda. And what I will say is, I'll come back to that. Um, giving us the presentation this morning will be Naomi Shinkins. And if there are any highways issues, Neil Turner will be dealing with those. Naomi, over to you, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. OK. Um, OK, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members. Um, yes, so this is the planning application for the land west of Cranbourne Road in Wimborne Minster. Um, this application was referred to committee in October 2019 at the request of the head of service and head of planning due to the number of proposed dwellings outstanding objections from consultees and given the application relates to a core strategy option site. The application was deferred at the October committee for reasons explained on the next slide and the application is returned to committee for consideration now following the receipt of amended plans. Um, the, in terms of an update uh, on the application further to the um, officer's report written in December 2020, um, I can now confirm the Dorset Council Urban Design, Landscape and Conservation Officers have advised they are now satisfied with the proposed block in the southeast corner and I'll discuss the details of that later. The uh, Dorset Council Urban Design, Landscape and landscape officers has also confirmed they are also satisfied with the details of the proposed urban square subject to the tree conditions uh, tree pit conditions which have already been imposed therefore the officer recommendation is now for approval where um, the outstanding design details have been agreed um, further to this the urban square detail design drawing will be added to the approved drawing lists and as a result of these updated details, the landscape drawings will also be updated on the approved drawing list. Um, also to note, some of the revisions of the engineering drawings uh, on the approved drawing list need to be updated where the revisions are incorrect. Um, the following presentation is based on the presentation made at the October committee. Uh, members should note there are approximately, approximately 70 slides in this, um, in this presentation and they are numbered on the top should you wish to refer to a particular slide after the presentation. Given the number of slides and, slide and time constraints of the virtual committee, it is not possible to present all slides and details which were already presented to members in October 2020. Therefore, my presentation will focus on slides with updated information in relation to deferred items. These slides are identified with a deferred item information note in the bottom right corner. 
So in terms of the committee deferral, um, again, it was deferred at the October committee and for, uh, for the following reasons. Um, the approach to renewable energy was considered unacceptable. Uh, the, there was concerns regarding the use of chimneys and the detailing for these. There was concerns regarding the Amherst block in the southeast corner of the site. There was concerns regarding the design, use and function of the urban square. Um, there were concerns regarding the private refuse collection proposed for a small number of um, plots on the site. Concerns regarding the control of lighting on private dwellings. Um, the road construction of private roads was also raised as a concern. The landscape on the western boundary raised as a concern. Um, questions were raised regarding connectivity throughout the site and questions were raised regarding the water quality impacts um, on the adjacent River Allen. So in terms of location and context, um, this is unchanged from the October committee. So this shows the location within the wider committee area. Um, and the outline permission formalised the principle of development of a new neighbourhood on 24.3 hectares of agricultural land to the north um, of the urban area of Winborne, as shown on the slide here. And this was allocated as part of policy WMC7 of the Christchurch and East Dorset local plan. This slide shows the approved illustrative master plan, and this is the fourth reserve matters application submission in respect of the residential development. The current application relates to development on the parcel west of Cranbourne Road. These images show the views north and south on Cranbourne Road, where we can see the application site here and here. These images show the existing development closest to the application site, um, which includes the residential dwellings to the southeast, the commercial to the south, and the new dwellings on the um, eastern parcel. So the application site, this information is unchanged from the October committee. Um, the site within the red line boundary is 10.2 hectares in total and rises to the north where land levels are highest with views of the um, Wimborne Minster. Substantial protected trees are located to the north, east and west, um, as we can see in this plan here. Um, and the frontage to Cranbourne Road has a substantial hedge and vegetation and this hedge will be retained. The site is located within the main urban area of Wimborne and Coal Hill and is adjacent to Greenbelt land. The Cranbourne Chase and West Wiltshire Downs area of outstanding natural beauty lies approximately 300 metres to the west and um, the site is also located in the vicinity of um, conservation areas. The site history, this again unchanged from the October committee. So the outline application for residential residential development of up to 630 dwellings, a new local centre, a replacement and extended Wimborne First School, public open space and new allotments together with new access streets and other related infrastructure with all matters reserve. Um, there was also an application for suitable alternative natural green space um, and we can see this is the western parcel located here and the related sang um, to the north and south. Reserve matters applications have been approved for the eastern parcel and this is currently under construction with some dwellings occupied. So the proposed development, uh, some of the slides in this section have been updated in relation to deferred items. So again, um, as a summary, the committee deferred consideration of the application for the following reasons. So the approach to renewable energy. Um, in response to this, uh, photovoltaic panels have been added and the previously, um, uh, previously proposed wastewater heat recovery systems have been removed. The use of chimneys and detailing, a further 27 ch chimneys have been added to the Victorian extension. Regarding the design of the Amherst block in the southeast corner, um, the Amherst block has been relocated and replaced with a two-storey terrace block. Um, regarding the design, use and function of the urban square, further design detail has been provided. Um, regarding private refuse collection, these issues have been resolved and now conform to the Dorset Waste Partnership guidance um, and private collection is no longer required. For the control of lighting on private dwellings, condition seven has been added to the officer's report, um, which restricts this. Regarding the road construction of private roads, um, details have been provided, um, which conform 
to the Dorset Council Highways adoptable standards in terms of the construction specification. Um, regarding landscaping on the western boundaries, um, on the western boundary, some improvements um, with additional landscaping has been provided where possible. Regarding connectivity, plans have been provided to highlight the pedestrian, cycle and vehicular connections um, provided. And regarding the water quality impacts, a statement from the Environment Agency provided um, highlights there are no concerns regarding um, potential pollution. Um, I will discuss each of these items in detail um, throughout the presentation. Um, so the plan initially submitted on the left and the revised plan submitted in June 2020 as presented at the October Committee is on the right. And this did include significant design and landscape changes to address um, consultee comments. Um, in relation to the deferred committee items, these, this is the revised plan submitted in November 2020 and there were a few additional amendments in response to consultee comments. So the key areas of change to this proposed plan in relation to deferred items, um, again, which will be discussed in more detail later, include um, the approach to renewable energy where PV panels have been provided across the site, further 27 chimneys located within the um, Victorian extension area. The design of the Amherst block um, has now been replaced by a two storey um, terrace option located here and the Amherst block has been lo located, relocated within the site here. Um, the urban square located here for the detail has been provided, which has been agreed with the urban design and landscape officers. Um, the private refuse collection concerns, turning areas have been provided, which means the areas here and here now conform with the Dorset Waste Partnership guidance. And the landscape on the western boundaries, um, on the western boundary, improvements have been made where possible, and the extent of the existing um, vegetation has also been identified and explained. Um, this shows the street scenes um, where the hilltop village is located um, to the top of the site, and the Victorian extension, which shows the updated uh, block in the southeast corner. Uh, this is an image that was shown at the October um, committee, which shows the view from the sang frontage and um, the viewpoint located here. Um, some examples within the hilltop village as presented back in October. Then some examples of house types within the Victorian extension again as presented back in October. This is the Amherst block again, which has been relocated within the site. In terms of local representations, um, this is unchanged from the October committee and as presented then four letters of representation were received. The majority of concerns raised were addressed at outline stage. However, impact on the AOMB and impact on neighbouring immunity are addressed in section eight of the officer's report. The principle of development again is unchanged. So the principle of the residential development for up to 630 dwellings across the eastern and western parcels has been agreed with the outline planning application and is as per the policy WMC7. Um, slides have been updated under layout appearances and scale um, in relation to the deferred items. So the outline consent included the requirement that condition uh, that condition two that the development shall accord with the three parameter plans, namely the land use plans located here, um, the plan movement and um, sorry, this is the land use and open spaces plans, the plan movement and the landscape plans. So this is the plan submitted in November 2020. Um, as presented at the October committee, the shape of the parcels have been reproduced generally in line with the master plan for this reserve matters application. And this includes the um, changes that have been made in uh, as submitted in November 2020 in response to the deferred items. Um, regarding connectivity, concerns were raised at the October committee that the proposed development lacked connectivity. Uh, drawings have been submitted to I to highlight the connections um, as proposed. And this first, first drawing shows the connections to the wider area. So um, it shows the connection, connections to the adjacent site, which has the um, first school and the local centre, the connections, uh, pedestrian connections throughout the site and within the SANG, which then also connect to public open space. Um, it also identifies 
um, the uh, walk to the town centre, which is approximately 10 minutes and approximately 10 minutes to Waitrose and is approximately 15 minute walk to the Queen Elizabeth School um, located here. Um, this shows the connections within the site and to the related site across the road and includes pedestrian access across the site to the adjacent eastern, eastern parcel as um, indicated by the green arrows, the shared ve vehicular and cycle routes and the shared and vehicular um, pedestrian spaces and the um, sang and public open uh, pedestrian walks throughout the site. So the approved design code identifies um, the areas where development of up to two, 2.5 and three storeys in height can be accommodated across the site. And this was assessed as, as part of the environmental impact assessment in the outline application. So um, as we can see, the proposal has been revised where we now have the two storey um, terrace block located in the southeast corner. And again, the Amherst block has been relocated within the site to here. Um, the highest uh, buildings are 10.3 to 12 metres to the ridge height, and that is located generally within the sites around the urban square and along the um, linear park. This um, shows the difference uh, of what's being proposed in the southeast corner. Um, this is again the previously proposed Amherst block located within the site to here, and this is now the proposed uh, terrace block, which is more in line with uh, dwelling existing dwellings opposite, and we can see is 8.2 metres in height. Um, the proposed design for this block has been agreed with the urban design, landscape and conservation officers, um, and again is more in line with the existing dwellings opposite. Here we can see the previously proposed street scene with the Amherst block and the proposed southeast, um, the new uh, block within the southeast corner. Um, in terms of the appearance as presented in the October committee, um, we have the Hilltop Village and the Victorian extension and just updated to show the block in the southeast corner. Highways and parking, which has been updated due to the deferred items. So this is the um, plan for roads to be adopted, which are highlighted in purple and is as presented at the October committee. Again, the concerns were raised at the October committee regarding the proposed road construction for roads um, that would not be adopted. Um, construction details have been provided and the Dorset Council Highways team have confirmed these conform to Dorset Council adoptable standards in terms of the specification required. Parking is as presented in the, in the October committee, um, but the plan has been updated to, to show the new southeast block and the relocated Amherst block. Parking numbers are also unchanged from the October committee presentation and um, are considered acceptable. So the Hilltop Village, there was generally no design changes where most of the changes were made to the Victorian extension. Um, the Hilltop Village comprises plots 401 to 538, which is 137 dwellings. And the proposed design of the Hilltop Village is generally unchanged, as mentioned um, uh, from the October committee. But um, and you can see the proposed character areas on on the slide. The Victorian extension contains 173 dwellings and this section has been updated in relation to deferred items. So the Victorian extension comprises plots 539 to 712, which contains, um, which is 173 dwellings. Key changes in response to deferred items um, is the relocation of the Amherst block, um, which we can see in the second street scene. Um, we can see it in relation to the 2.5 storey um, buildings adjacent and some of the three storey um, buildings um, to, the, to the south of it. Um, and in the third street scene, again, it's the block to the southeast corner. Um, in terms of chimneys, which is a deferred item, a further 27 chimneys have been added to the Victorian extension um, to the south of the site, and eight chimneys have been re relocated here to ensure an appropriate balance of chimneys visually. 
So the chimneys have been cited to ensure they make a positive contribution towards the street scene and the uh, wider Cranbourne Road area. And this results in a total of 81 chimneys overall on, this, um, uh, on the western parcel. So in terms of the landscaping and trees, this has been updated in response to deferred items. Um, this slide shows an example of the landscaping as presented at the October committee, committee which was um, considered to be generally acceptable. However, the western boundary, boundary was raised as a concern and is a deferred item. So in terms of that western boundary, the existing um, extent of what is on the site. Um, this slide shows that and it shows um, trees which range from 7 to 21 metres in height. Um, further to identifying the existing ex extents of the boundaries, additional trees have been added to improve this for a possible as highlighted in the example on the slide. So we can see um, additional trees have been located um, here, for example, and in total, a um, 38 extra heavy standard trees are being provided on the western boundary. Um, in addition to the deferred item of the western boundary, the um, Dorset Council Landscape Officer did request that further planting be provided on the southern boundary. Um, where possible, planting has been provided and there is a total of 39 extra heavy standard trees on the southern boundary. However, there are um, infrastructure um, restrictions along this boundary um, in terms of drainage um, and other infrastructure matters, um, which is, is restricting the planting that can be provided here. Um, also to note with regard to the landscaping, the East Dorset Environment Partnership have raised concerns regarding invasive species um, that are still proposed. The applicant has removed a number of invasive species and have done this in consultation um, with the Dorset Natural Environment team. And the Dorset Natural Environment team have advised that the information provided in the officer's report relating to their response regarding non-native species is correct. The proposed hard landscaping is, a previously, is as previously proposed with the addition of the construction details that conform with the Dorset Council adoption standards in terms of the private roads that won't be adopted. Um, this slide shows the proposed urban square details. Again, this has been agreed by the uh, urban design, Dorset Council Urban Design and Landscape Officers. Um, this includes more details such as the addition of varying materials such as chipped tarmac um, located here and paving around um, the square itself and within the square. Um, it will be on a raised table which provides um, speed restriction measures. Um, other details included additional planting and um, uh, planters which also uh, double up as seating and seating around um, trees are proposed as well. Also the railing types have been changed to a more urban environment to match the um, design of the urban square. This shows how the space can be used um, and again we can see the multifunctional um, planting and seating and the proposed landscaping um, as shown. It gives you um, a 3D view of the square itself and this is how it might be used for another function such as a market as discussed at the October committee. Um, the proposed boundary treatments are as presented in the October committee and are considered acceptable. The locally equipped area of play which has been provided, um, this is provided to the centre of the site and as, is as presented at the October committee where it was considered acceptable. Impact on neighbouring amenity, an update on this in relation to deferred items. So third party concerns were raised that the proposed development would impact negatively on um, neighbouring amenity, particularly the Amherst apartment block fronting um, Cranbourne Road to the southeast. While it was considered acceptable in terms of neighbouring amenity, it is now relocated within the site, as shown here, um, and um, the, that concern is no, uh, no longer an issue. All other matters in relation to neighbouring amenity um, were considered acceptable, subject to the obscure glazing condition um, that was previously proposed. In terms of heritage assets, um, there were some previous concerns in relation to the impact on the conservation area surrounding the site and the views of the Minster. 
As presented at the October committee, this has been addressed by reducing the heights of proposed units fronting Cranbourne Road, as we can see in these images, where initially the 2.5 storey um, dwellings were proposed and some three storey dwellings along Cranbourne Road. Um, as presented in October, these have been reduced and we have better views of the, of the um, Minster as you um, continue down Cranbourne Road. As Pretty mentioned, the southeast block is now a two storey terrace with Victorian detailing, and this has been agreed, the design of this has been agreed with the um, conservation and urban design officers. In terms of the area of outstanding natural beauty or the AOMB, the Cranbourne, um, the AOMB lies approximately 300 metres to the west of the current proposal of, of the application site. The impacts on the AOMB were assessed at the outline stage and it was judged that the appearance of the proposal would result in indirect visual effects on a minor proportion of the overall characters, but the impact would be negligible. Conditions imposed at the outline stage to make the development acceptable included condition 20H, which re requires the submission of a lighting strategy um, to control the impact of lighting in this area close to the AOMB. As advised at the October committee, the proposed lighting will be as per the Eastern parcel and the OMB officer has raised concerns about this. As presented in October, Dorset Council Highways noted that the proposed development needs to be considered within its context, taking into account urban sprawl, highway safety and additional energy required to achieve the dark night sky requirement. On balance, it was considered that a, dark, a highway's dark night skies requirement would not apply to this site. Um, Dorset Council Highways have also advised that lights on residential roads will be switched off between five midnight and 5.30am, except where there are physical features which um, um, may be required to lit, which is required by statute, um, such as speed humps, etc. Condition 7 has also been added to the officer report, which removes permitted development for additional lights on private dwellings. Um, biodiversity remains unchanged from the October committee. So the impact on Dorset Heathlands is unchanged and um, where the sound provision provides sufficient mitigation. The landscape and ec ecological management plan, which is which was submitted, is unchanged from the October presentation where it was agreed with the Dorset Natural Environment Team, the Dorset Council Green Infrastructure Advice Team and the Dorset Council Tree Officer. In terms of drainage, an update has been, been provided um, in relation to deferred items. So there are some changes to the drainage in relation to the revised layout and um, the Environment Agency were consulted on this and have no objection um, to any of the changes proposed. The Environment Agency have also confirmed they have no concerns regarding possible pollution of the River Allen, um, which was a deferred committee item. In terms of the waste collection, um, Previously, the waste collection was required for plots 596 to 600 and 682 to 688. Um, the applicant has submitted a revised design which includes turning areas um, in, these, um, in these locations um, for the required bin lorries and the Dorset Waste Partnership have confirmed that this conforms with their guidance and private collection is no, lo no longer required. Um, that condition has been removed from the officer's report. In terms of affordable housing, um, the proposed affordable housing numbers remain unchanged and the plan shown here highlights the changes to the layout as per the revised design. In terms of the energy statement, this is a deferred item and has been updated. So previously the uh, wastewater heat recovery system uh, was proposed to achieve the required 10% of renewable energy source, which is set out in condition 22 of the outline application. However, this was considered unacceptable and um, uh, changes have been made to this. So the changes are P uh, photovoltaic panels are now proposed to achieve the required 10% and photovoltaic, photovoltaic panels have been um, located by a consultant on the most efficient roofscapes while considering the sensitive location in fronting Cranbourne Road. The Dorset Council Conservation Landscape and Urban Design Offices are satisfied with the proposed location and also the proposed inset photovoltaic panels. Um, 
it is noted some consultees have requested further photovoltaic panels be provided across the scheme. However, the proposed number of panels satisfies the 10% requirements set out in condition 22 of the outline application. So just as a reminder, in terms of committee deferral, um, the again, the committee deferral um, matters are the approach to renewable energy, um, where PV panels have been provided, the use of chimneys where further chimneys have been provided, the design of the Amherst block in the southeast corner, which has now been replaced with a two-storey terrace block, um, the, des the design use and function of the urban square, uh, which further de design detail has been provided, private refuse collection concerns, this issue is resolved and the layout now conforms to the Dorset Waste Partnership guidance. Um, the control of lighting and private dwellings, condition seven has been added to the officer report regarding this. The road construction, um, it is considered the road construction conforms to the DC, DC highways adoptable standards in terms of the specification. Um, landscaping on the western boundary, some improvements have been made with additional landscaping where possible and the extent of the existing ha has been identified. In terms of connectivity, the pedestrian, cycle and vehicular connections have been identified. And in terms of the water quality, a statement has been provided from the Environment Agency um, noting they have no concerns um, regarding pollution. So as part of this application, details have also been submitted to discharge um, the um, some conditions from the outline application. So um, in terms of uh, what will be discharged, the um, finished floor levels will be discharged. Materials, not all the uh, materials have been agreed, therefore that will not be discharged. The highways layout will be discharged, secure by design requirements discharged, landscaping requirements discharged, including la hard landscaping. Um, the tree and um, the landscaping and ecological management plan conditions will be discharged, drainage conditions discharged, energy statement conditions discharged, the construction and environment management plan will be discharged. In terms of ground investigation, further information is required, so this will not be discharged and the lighting strategy condition will be discharged. In terms of conditions on the officer's report, um, approved plans uh, as listed. Again, some updates to those um, revisions are required. Um, parking revision um, to be retained, including garages, obscure glazing, which is for the first floor bathrooms that may be overlooking some of the neighbouring amenity within the site. The um, condition regarding the local equipped area of play costings um, is still included. The soft landscaping and trees, which includes the tree beat Pit details um, is still on the officer's reports, and condition seven has been added regarding no additional lighting on private dwellings. Naomi, before you move on, you've left out condition three. Ah, uh, yes. Um, could I just, um, apologies, I'll have to change my screen to, to check the officer's report. Could I? Just... Would you like me to read it out? I've got the officer's yes, report please. in front that of me. That would be helpful. Thank you. So, Condition three is roof extensions, yeah. um, notwithstanding the provisions of the Town and Country Planning GDPO Order uh, 2015 and any subsequent reenactments thereof, there shall be no extensions to the roofs of the dwellings under Schedule 2 Part 1 Classes A, A or B hereby permitted. In interest of visual and neighbouring amenity because of the relationship of the site to the AONB and Wimborne Minster and Burt's Hill Conservation Areas. Uh, thank you. And just to note that was as presented at the October committee. So in summary, um, the principle of development is unchanged and considered acceptable. The impact on biodiversity is unchanged and considered acceptable. Affordable housing is unchanged and is in accordance with the section 106. The impact on neighbouring amenity is unchanged and considered acceptable subject to condition. The design of the proposed has been updated in relation to deferred items and considered acceptable. The proposed landscaping has been updated in relation to deferred items and considered acceptable subject to condition. The impact on the OMB updated um, in response to deferred items and acceptable subject to condition. The impact on heritage assets is uh, also updated and considered acceptable. 
the proposed layout and parking arrangements updated in response to the design changes and considered acceptable and drainage also updated in response to design changes and considered acceptable. So as noted at the beginning um, in my update, the officer's recommendation is now for approval where the design details which were previously outstanding when writing the officer's report are now agreed by the Dorset Council Landscape, Urban Design and Conservation Officers. Thank you very much, Naomi. It was still a very long presentation and very detailed. And thank you for all the work you've put into that and um, behind the scenes since uh, we last saw this at committee. I'm now going to move on to the public representations. Chelsea Goddard, do you want to take us through those representations, please? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. <laughs> the first comment we've received is from Bob Mizon. I'm in receipt of the email from Development Management about the development of land west of the Cranbourne Road, north of Wimborne. As I have stated in previous communications, I am in favour of such developments on the condition that their street lighting and exterior light fittings conform to a standard that will not impinge through direct and reflected light upon the dark night skies of the Cranbourne Chase A and B and International Dark Sky Reserve immediately to the north. All such lights on this development should be at the minimum brightness for the lighting task to rule out excessive ground reflection, not exceed a correlated colour temperature of 3000 K in the interest of the well-being of both humans and local biodiversity and be directed exactly where needed. May I assume that as happens with the vast majority of street lighting in Dorset, street lights will be switched off between midnight and 5 a.m., a measure that has proved itself nationally as a great money and energy saving and crime reduction strategy. The next comment is from Simon Ivell on behalf of Bloor Homes. As members may recall, a decision on this plan application was deferred at the planning committee on 28th October for a number of reasons. Bloor Homes wishes to thank members for the opportunity to further improve the proposal before committee today. Bloor Homes has sought to positively engage with your officers and has responded positively to all the suggestions and requests made. We trust you will agree that the amendments made have considerably improved the development and will further assist to secure a high quality form of development for Wimborne. In particular, we would, like, we would highlight the following changes. Provision of photovoltaic panels to 82 homes supplying 10% of energy from this renewable source in accordance with outline requirements. Additional chimneys have been added to provide a further positive contribution to the street scene. Relocation of the Amherst apartment block away from Cranbourne Road with an enhanced architect architectural led design. A terrace of four homes of a bespoke design is now proposed on the frontage of Cranbourne Road. The design of the urban square has been improved to create an attractive and flexible space. The internal road layout has been amended such that no private waste collection is now needed. The tree belt on the western boundary is to be further reinforced with additional tree planting proposed. A footpath has been added to the eastern edge of the site improving connectivity for pedestrians. Furthermore, the Environment Agency has confirmed that the SUDS strategy is acceptable and will have no potential impacts on water quality in the River Allen. Private roads will be constructed to adoptable standards as agreed with highways officers. Bloor's homes will, Bloor's will accept the removal of committed development rights regarding further lighting on the site. Bloor would again wish to emphasise the significance of the timing of this application and the importance of securing approval at this critical stage, highlighting that Phase one is due to complete in June 2021. To secure the continuity of local construction jobs, site preparation works do need to begin imminently to ensure continuity of powers and delivery, including much needed affordable homes. The proposal will deliver the balance of infrastructure and Section 106 contributions committed under the outline permission. Law Homes would like to thank members and officers for the continued advice and feedback throughout the process. We trust that the amendments made address all the points that have been raised and demonstrate Bloor's commitment to delivering a high quality neighbourhood for Wimborne and that members will be in a position to fully endorse the application for approval based on the extensive suite of amendments made. That's all the comments for this application. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Uh, Naomi or uh, Kim Cowell, are there any salient points that you want to pick up from what we've heard so far before I move to the member debate? Um, if I could just jump in, Madam Chair, regarding um, the lighting and the comments made on that. Um, as presented, um, the proposed lighting, particular highways lighting, is as per the eastern parcel. 
Um, Dorset Council Highways require 4,000 Kelvin um, and, and not 3,000 Kelvin. And as noted, um, they do not consider this particular site meets the requirements for the dark night skies um, lighting. OK, thank you very much. So I am now going to move on to the member debate. Um, my first speaker is Shane Bartlett, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and um, thank you, Naomi, for an excellent report. It was really first class. Uh, and I think the what's come out of that for me is that the committee to refuse the application back in October. I think the officers have gone away and sat down with the developer and have managed to come up with a far better proposal now. I'm a lot happier with the lot that's contained within this proposal. I think the approach to renewable energy is good. I like the uh, idea of the photovoltaic panels. Uh, the 27 chimneys um, will add to the development and help it to blend in with um, Wimble Minster, particularly in that Victorian extension. Um, the Elmhurst block to be moved, I think, is another good thing. And I think um, arranging those around that square, I think, will help to enhance that particular part of the development. The urban square itself, I'm really pleased with the way that is now looking. It will give a nice centre to the, uh, the de development and give a social centre to the residents that are using that space so they can have um, village markets, farmers markets, charitable um, events, that type of thing. The only thing I would like if the officer could come back at the end of me speaking is as to whether or not the table, um, the tables that are going to be put to the highways there will be of a sufficient height to ensure that we're not going to have any speeding traffic and that the tra traffic will have to um, accommodate those tables at, a, at a, a speed that means it will be safe if there's a lot of um, pedestrian movement on that square. Uh, the waste removal is a, is fantastic to hear that that has now been accommodated to, to a DWP standard because that really was a nonsense what was put before us before. The lighting condition um, again is good, good to hear that and the road construction that although those secondary roads as I, as I saw refer to them um, are not going to be adopted um, by the council but they are going to be built and adopted standard which I'm really pleased to hear. Um, and the landscaping on the western boundary is an improvement on that and the connectivity is now more uh, is, is, is now more understandable and the water impacts from the environment agency they're the experts in this field and I guess we have to go along with what they say so all in all madam chairman I think is a vast improvement on what we have before us and I would congratulate the officers on what they've done with the developers and bring this back before us it's, it's a far different application to what we saw before and I'm much happier but I, I, if the office could just um, give me some reassurance that that, that tabled um, highways area in the in the urban square is going to be to a sufficient height that will prevent any speeding traffic through there. Thank you. Can we have a response to that concern, please? Um, Neil, could I ask Neil Turner to um, address that concern because it will be agreed as part of the highways works. It will. Yeah, thanks Naomi. Um, yeah, the, the uh, as those areas are, uh, are within the areas that are proposed for adoption, we would uh, ensure that, that the ramps are compliant with, with the right standards. So they'll be two metres wide, uh, 100 millimetres high uh, with a gradient of one in 20, which is a, a kind of standard uh, specification for, for highway ramps. So that they, they'll be substantial um, and would act as a, a traffic calming feature. That's great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shane, at this moment, did you want to make a proposal or do you want to hear what other people have to say first? I think business is such a big development. I'm, I'm happy to listen to other members first. I think that'd be right to do. Um, but as things stand at the moment, I'm I'm perfectly happy to uh, accept the application as it is before us, but I'll listen to what the members say at the moment. Thank you. OK, thank you. My next speaker is David Took. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually a planning or a road safety issue uh, and I'll be happy to take guidance from officers on it. But my concern is is children crossing the main Cranbourne Road to get to the school on the other side. Um, and and we, I'm, I'm concerned that that road is quite a quick road. Um, I drive down it myself quite regularly every time I go to Wimborne and it, it 
there is an awful lot of fast moving traffic going down it. And I'd just like some reassurance that there will be something in place to help children cross the road to get to school. Um, as I say, I'm not sure if it's a, a planning matter or if it's, if it's purely road safety, but perhaps officers could uh, help me on that. Thank you. Neil, would you like to respond to those comments, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I uh, take the member's point. It's uh, Cramble Road is a, is a 30 mile an hour road, so it, I think it isn't a planning issue. It's, it's more of a, a road safety and, and uh, speed limit enforcement issue. Um, the uh, the applicant has carried out a, a series of works along Cramble Road as part of the, the wider outline application for, for the whole of this development, um, including kind of narrowing the road, putting in uh, pedestrian refuge islands, crossing points. So um, uh, pedestrian facilities have been improved as part of the overall uh, outline application with this development. Um, and, uh, and and the, the, the speed limit is, is 30 miles an hour at the moment. So it, I think that is more of a, a, an enforcement issue um, that perhaps we, we can look at separately. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I certainly think 30 miles an hour um, is not always adhered to strictly with traffic going down that road. So I think enforcement would be important, but thank you. And of course, the um, safer routes to schools will also, once the development is up and running and the houses are occupied, then they will take that into account. All right, thank you. So again, that's something that can be re revisited later. I'm going to move on to our next speaker and that's Brian Heatley, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, after our discussion last time, I'm really pleased to see uh, the photovoltaic panels here, uh, which seem to me to meet unambiguously uh, the requirement in the local plan for 10% coming from decentralised and low carbon energy generation. So that's great. Uh, I've done my own back of the envelope calculation. It does look like around 10%. Uh, would have been lovely to have more, but I accept it meets the plan. I'm a little disappointed that we've lost the um, heat recovery which is of course valuable. My concern last time was that it wasn't particularly relevant to the plan, but it is nevertheless valuable in its own um, right. And I, I, I would like some reassurance that if we agree this today as it is, it doesn't prevent them from putting it in. I can't see why it should, but uh, I, I'd hate people to think that somehow or other this was something we were dismissing as bad, which is not the case. Uh, it, my concern was that it didn't really meet what the plan wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Naomi, did you want to respond to that, please? Yeah, yes, it, it won't um, it, it won't exclude wastewater heat recovery being um, put into houses, but what is propose yeah. are the photovoltaics which meets the requirement of the condition. Yeah. Thank you. So bear with me, just getting my microphone back on. Thank you for that. My next speaker is Alex Brenton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm quite pleased that we did defer this application in the autumn. I think this is a great improvement and um, the PV panels in particular. I am slightly concerned that when we flagged up in the autumn that this site was not, when we talked about connectivity, we were talking about connectivity down to Wimborne and that what we have now according to sort of slide 31 is yes there is there we have indicated where the cycle path and the uh, footpaths are, but we haven't increased them and we haven't um, indicated a cycle path back into Wimborne town itself. You're still pushing people to cycle down the actual road carriageway once you leave, which as we all know can get a bit um, intimidating for younger children or for people with cycle you know, tricycles with trailers the sort of thing that this 
um, development ought to be able to be lived in comfortably by people who rarely use a car. And I think we are missing a little bit of push on encouraging more cycle um, network. I see in the original conditions that the developer is um, going to either pay for or part pay for a pedestrian bridge over the River Allen. And I would have liked a little bit more information like that. I'm sure it's that won't happen until the building starts, but it would be nice to have had a bit more detail of that up front. And I would like recommend, um, an assurance that the pedestrian bridge will be accessible on a bicycle, not just um, by as a footpath, because that could make the world of difference as to how one accesses town instead of sort of squeezing everybody onto this relatively busy um, road with the 30 mile an hour limit. Thank you. Naomi, would you like to come back on those comments and uh, maybe refer to Neil as well if necessary? Uh, yes, I can do. Um, yeah, uh, I'll get Neil to sort of supplement anything with, with um, Highway's comments, but um, within the site itself, um, the applicant has provided 5.5 metre wide roads, which provides sufficient width for, for cars and, and cycling. Um, and we could see where there's, um, apologies, um, the shared cycle and vehicular routes. Um, the outside of the site, there are agreed works in terms of um, the highways works for the pedestrian access across Cranbourne Road. I think there are wider issues in terms of cycling infrastructure on um, existing roads such as, as Cranbourne Road, which um, in planning we can't deal with because um, it goes beyond the remit of the site. Um, in terms of the bridge over the River Allen, um, that um, was a previous um, issue and I believe there are land ownership issues in relation to that, um, but we have received the money um, in relation to that obligation. Neil, was there anything you wanted to add regarding um, cycle infrastructure on the existing road? Uh, not too much, I'm afraid, but um, I, all I would add is that the, the transport assessment for, for the outline application agreed that the principles of connectivity and the necessary offsite highway improvement. So uh, th they were all uh, certainly agreed at the, the kind of outline stage um, rather than uh, with this particular application itself. OK, thank you for that. Alex, are you um, content with the response that you've received from officers? Uh, not desperately, but I do understand it's that terrible bit. Planners can only go so far. Highways can also only go so far. And um, I do think as a council, we should be trying very much more to integrate, to encourage cycle transport. But yes, I won't take it further. OK, thank you very much. My next speaker is Robin Cook. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And very quickly through you to Councillor Brenton, just to say to her to put her mind at rest, not totally about this development, but about Wimborne as a whole. There is a major, major work starting shortly to increase the amount of cycle lanes, particularly from the east of the town. So we're not without that option going forward. A lot of money has been ploughed into that and there's ongoing work. So I think we can all be uh, maybe happy that in the future there will be add ons which will connect. So I'm I'm optimistic. Um, right back to the point. Um, slide 32, if we may, I think it was 32. I just want a clarification, Naomi, uh, about the reciting of the Amherst block. I didn't quite catch that. I know it's obviously gone away from the southeast corner. Uh, but you said, was it up up here? There, and it remains unchanged in its design on that spot, does it? Yes, I can locate the street scene just. Uh... OK, OK, it's just for my own peace of mind on that, just to. Because it is rather, an, I was going to say an imposing building, it's quite quite a biggish structure and uh, certainly moving it from where it is, it, it was very, very sensible. Um, yeah, apologies. I'm just just looking for the um, street scene which shows it. Um, 
just bear with me. Uh, um, Typically, I didn't get a note of that slide number. Yeah, uh, um, here we go. So, so this is it located within, this is the linear park frontage. We yes, can see yeah. the, the Amherst block here. Yeah. This is the Amherst block. Um, okay. It's beside a 2.5 story. And then we can see in the background mm -hmm. these um, three story blocks located around the urban square. So it is in the vicinity of um, three the, the higher apartment blocks um, and there's higher apartment blocks located over here as well. Thank you. That That's answered my question. It does fit in actually quite well with the surroundings there. So thank you for that. OK, back to back to the point. Um, uh, yes, well, I think we gave this particular proposal what a forensic examination in October. And I think as a committee, we actually deserve to pat ourselves on the back because we didn't spend time pulling it apart and saying we shouldn't have it. But we went through it and were very, very constructive as far as I could see. And uh, the developer has really taken everything we've said on board and really, really tried to deal with it and presented it to us this morning. And I think there's a limit to how far we can go and perhaps try and amend this and try and amend that. You've heard the story about uh, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. I think we have to put ourselves in the hands of uh, the professionals to some extent. So I'm happy with what we're now presented with uh, and I'm going to propose that we accept the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a seconder, please? Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam Chairman. You were next to speak, Shane. You wanted to come yeah. back. Yeah, um, I concur with everything that Councillor Cook has said, and um, I, I would fully agree. I think the officers have done a fantastic job. I think that as a committee, we, as he says, we did give this a forensic approach, and the developers have listened to what we've said, and the officers and developers between them have, have accommodated for much of what we requested and what we asked for. I think we've got a far better development now in front of us, and I'm happy to second the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I would agree with those sentiments. Uh, sometimes design by committee does work and I think officers, the applicant, the public that have um, responded to this as well as the committee, I think by working together we've achieved something that's better for all. So thank you all for that. So I have no more speakers. I'm going to move to the vote now um, and again I need to go through a roll call. Sorry, Dave Norton, very quickly before we get to this point. Um, my understanding is that uh, the joining local members, Councillor Dover and Councillor Rowe, may wish to uh, have an input. Might there be an opportunity for, for them to do so before we go to the vote? I did speak to Councillor Dover before the meeting and she said that she did not wish to speak right. and I did not see that uh, Councillor O had actually attended the meeting. OK, for, I, I just wanted to establish um, that, that they, they, the provision had been made for them before we get to this point. Thank you. It would have been. Um, I'm not aware that Councillor O is in the meeting. Right. If she is, uh, Councillor O, did you wish to say anything? Fine. No, so I think I think we're clear to go to the vote. Thank you. That's all right. Wouldn't want a full foul of uh, democratic. So we have uh, the application has been um, proposed and seconded for grant um, as set out, and I will just read it because it is um, to delegate authority to the head of planning. Uh, so the recommendation is to delegate to grant subject to A, the conditions and reasons set out below and B, the receipt of design details of the urban square and plots 606 to 609 by the 31st of January 2021 or such extended time as agreed by the head of planning or relevant lead officer and C, those design details being acceptable to the Head of Planning Service in consultation with the Chairman and Vice Chairman of this committee, and D, the imposition of any conditions which the Head of Planning considers necessary in relation to the submitted details. 
And I've just seen a comment from Naomi that the details are now agreed. So I hope members are in support of the recommendation and I will now go to the vote. So Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have uh, witnessed the officer's presentation. I've taken part in the debate and I vote for. Thank you. Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I have listened to the debate. I have seen all the presentation. Um, I have gone through it myself separately and I vote for. Thank you. Robin Cook. Yes, Madam Chairman, thank you. I followed the presentation in detail, uh, listened and taken part in the debate and I've no hesitation in uh, supporting Grant. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Uh, Presence for our chair and uh, vote for approval. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I've been present throughout the presentation in the debate and uh, uh, I, I grant uh, for. Thank you. Brian Heatley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've been present throughout and I vote for, please. Thank you. David Morgan. I've heard all the debate, Madam Chairman, and I vote for. Thank you. Julie Robinson. I've been present throughout and I vote for. Thank you. David Took. I've been present throughout. Uh, <clears throat> I note that camels run as fast as horses and survive better in the desert, uh, and I vote for. Thank you. Bill Trite. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've taken all uh, information into consideration. Uh, the principle of development here has long been conceded, um, and so uh, I, I vote in favour of the recommendation. Thank you. And John Worth. I've been present throughout and I vote for the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, I will get formal uh, confirmation, but I do believe that's unanimous. It is indeed unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. So that is granted as per the officer report. Thank you all very much. So we will now move on to the next application. And that is agenda item six, three twenty zero four nine nine, uh, full application. The erection of a multi use games area, a MUGA, comprising of a synthetic surface, three metre high perimeter ball stop netting, and eight by eight metre lighting columns. Uh, with additional and amended documents received the 6th of July 2020 at St Ives Primary and Nursery School, Sandy Lane, St Leonard's and St Ives. And this item is pages 99 to 116 on the agenda. And Liz Adams will be taking us through this one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members. So this application for a community sports facility, as has just been described to you, comes before you in the light of concerns raised by the Parish Council and also the large number of public consultation responses, both for and against the proposal. The recommendation of your officers is that the application be approved. The site lies within the urban area of St Ives and this is on the eastern edge of the county. Within uh, the existing primary school grounds, so this is the primary school, and the school is a single storey building surrounded by residential properties. So the proposed multi-use games area would be 50 metres in length by 27 metres wide and the intention is that the MUGA, as it is easy, more easily uh, referred to, is to be used by the school pupils during the day um, and flood lighting will enable use by sports clubs during the evening up till half past eight. The school would control third party use which would be uh, in, in accordance with a management plan that has been submitted. Now significant local objection to the proposal has been received. 71 letters um, were raising objections 
following the initial consultation were received and these are set out in the table at paragraph 6.02 of the report. The main concerns are anticipated harm to neighbouring amenity from traffic, from noise and light pollution, with particular concerns raised about the original proposal that the MUGA should open till 10pm. Impacts on road safety, the character of the area and antisocial behaviour were also raised. Now, following submission of additional details, which reduce the opening hours to 8.30 and setting out a management plan to control the impacts from third party users, a further consultation resulted in 32 further letters of, um, from original objectors who considered that the issues they had raised remained pertinent. 27 letters raising no objection and 18 letters in support of the proposal were also received and these welcome the benefits of the additional sports facilities in the area. So the MUGA is to be constructed of dark green all weather surfacing with three metre high uh, metal poles holding dark grey or black ball stop netting. This netting will contain the majority of stray balls and it absorbs noise that I would say um, that can be associated with hard fencing and or backboards associated with sports like hockey. So it's proposed that the MUGA is served by eight floodlights, which will be used during winter months to enable evening use of the pitch. The introduction of the MUGA onto the school field will have a visual impact. It will reduce openness, but the sports facility will not appear incongruous within the school setting and the netting has a visual permeability which will avoid significant harm. Here we see um, the vegetation in the verge alongside part of the school boundary. Um, this is Sandy Lane here, we're looking up the lane towards the school, so the MUGA would be in this area here. Uh, from a bit set a bit further back, you can see the extent of the, the verge hedging. And then um, from the other direction, we can see that the school is a lot more open. So you would see the Mooga netting in, in that view. And then here we're looking west along Sandy Lane um, and the school is here on the, on the right. So in, in part of the, um, in part of views along Sandy Lane, it will be very screened. In other views, it will be open and evident. Now, a light spill chart has been provided to demonstrate that light, which is proposed for use uh, to enable the use of the MUGA for longer hours, uh, will be focused on the pitch with light spill minimised beyond the school grounds. So light levels at this blue perimeter that I've drawn here um, are one lux. Uh, and that's the amount of light that falls on one square metre surface that's one metre away from a single candle. So the levels in neighbouring gardens here we have uh, to the south are measuring about 0.2 or 0.1 lux and uh, they're not judged to be harmful being similar to a moonlit night. So it is recognised that the lit pitch will be visually prominent. Uh, obviously there's the screening down here but, um, but in views from this angle they'll be particularly um, evident. However, the lighting will, as I say, facilitate use by the community outside of school hours and will be switched off when the use of the pitch ceases, which is to be at 8.30 at the latest. Noise is another significant concern that's been raised by neighbouring residents. Uh, team sport activities obviously associated with noise of balls, with shouting, with whistles, and this is all erratic in nature. So the application is accompanied by a noise impact assessment, which was undertaken in June, and this considers the impacts for adjoining residents. Uh, the ambient noise levels at the site um, include the noise from the A31 to the south, um, and obviously because the noise impact assessment was undertaken in June during COVID, um, the ambient levels are likely to be robust, probably conservative. The predicted noise impact measurements came from Winchester Leisure Centre MUGA pitches um, and these were checked with other locations to ensure consistency. The levels include noises from um, balls hitting sideboards and chain link fencing and as I've said already neither of these are a feature of the proposed development which will use the ball stop fencing. Um, Sport England data sets were also used to predict noise associated with multiple sports and different participants. So they've considered the noise of children, women and men um, involved in sports on the sites. 
So when comparing the predicted average noise levels with the existing ambient noise levels, the study concluded that noise levels experienced by neighbours would not be at a level which is significant in noise terms. Um, neighbours dispute the school's claim that the field is currently used in evenings and it is recognised that the evening use of the MUGA will introduce additional noises uh, which will be evident to those in the locality, uh, especially between the, in the evening between 6 and 8.30 where it is often quieter. But the impact overall is classified as minor. Levels would remain below the maximums recommended by Sport England guidance and noise levels would meet World Health Organization averages for external noise in gardens and the internal noise levels recommended by British standards. So um, the use of the ball stop netting, the prohibition of backboards and whistles, public announcement system or any other amplified noises um, outside of school hours will all assist in mitigating the noise levels and the impact on amenity and these are recommendations that are included within the management plan that's been submitted to the council. The management plan also identifies a complaint procedure so that if there are breaches of the terms of use then these can be reported and followed up with users to enable the school to maintain control of the facility outside of school hours. So the difference between continuous noise levels and maximum intermittent levels are noted and the use of the MUGA will be noticeable, that's accepted. But with conditions in place to prevent the use of backboards, to limit the operational hours and to secure the management plan, your officers in conjunction with public health officers are satisfied that the application demonstrates that the noise impacts are not at a level where harm to living conditions is anticipated and therefore would not conflict with planning policies. Um, other concerns raised by neighbours have focused on antisocial behaviour and potential criminal activity that might arise as a result of the site being open to third parties outside of school hours. So the open air um, swimming pool that's already on the site is in use um, outside of school hours and it has a remote recording system which op is op sorry, in operation to deter poor behaviour. So the schools confirmed that this is going to be duplicated for the MUGA as it is in the school's interest obviously to protect its property and changing rooms and toilets are to be made available to third party users and the MUGA is to be located away from boundaries shared with residential properties. So overall it's not considered that the proposal will be detrimental to local security. Um, so the application site is shown here with the red dot um, together with other open spaces that are in the area of St Ives and St Leonard's. So the area benefits from Moors Valley um, to the north and Avon Country Park to the south. But the last open spaces study, um, admittedly undertaken in 2007, concluded that there was a deficit of active sports space um, with only two sites then available, Brayside Road Recreation Ground seen here and Horton Road Recreation Ground, which was the only one offering formal pitch provision. The open space um, report identified a particular need for facilities for children and teenagers and it noted that facilities for young people and children should be a priority despite the demographic profile in which older residents are a majority. So the primary school was identified as a particularly opportune location and the report encouraged the investigation of opportunities to improve facilities there for community use. And since 2007, although a lot of time has passed, the changes that have um, occurred in terms of open space provision are not significant. So it's considered that the report remains valid and appropriate recommendations. Um, Sport England have not objected to the proposal. Uh, they've commented that although the proposal will result in a loss of, of the school field, it will not have a harmful impact on the existing pitch layout and will bring benefits to school pupils and staff as well as the local community. So these layouts here show that the school field can still accommodate a running track, a rounders pitch and junior football pitch during the summer and two junior football pitches during the winter. Sport England have noted there is a shortage of this type of MUGA in Dorset and it will help to deliver central government objectives of schools being central to their local communities and in supporting communities to embrace healthy and active lifestyles. So Sport England have noted that the proposed lighting is a crucial element of the proposal as it will allow small games to be played during the winter afternoons and community use during the evenings between September and late March. Uh, concerns were also raised by objectors about tree loss on the site. 
So this aerial photo was taken before some of the trees were removed in 2019. So at that time, the trees were not protected. Uh, subsequently, a tree preservation order was placed on the four remaining trees shown here with the blue dots. Um, and so these, uh, the impact on these trees has been uh, considered during the application process. And the impact of the proposed development has now been fully considered and the council's arboriculture officer is satisfied that the proposed tree protection will enable trees to continue to thrive during and after construction. Parking, I think is the final concern to be um, by neighbour residents I'm going to consider here. There are a few parking restrictions on the surrounding roads and so these roads are used by parents when dropping and collecting their children with associated noise and disturbance for residents. Um, although the school can't control legal parking on the highway, um, in an attempt to mitigate any impacts, the third party management plan includes a requirement for those hiring the facility to advise participants to use the on-site parking and to drive onto the site for drop-off and collection. Uh, the school has a modest car park, which you can see here, this uh, area here and, and either side there. Um, obviously that's in use during the school day, um, but there's potential for um, drive through onto the school playground, which will offer overflow parking. And um, this, the provision of off-street parking is therefore reasonable requirement of suggested condition nine. So overall, the proposal for a new community facility is acceptable in principle and there will be limited harm to the character of the area. Uh, your planning and public health officers have worked with the school to identify reasonable and appropriate means to mitigate the impacts on neighbouring amenity in ways that maintain the functionality of the MUGA. The proposal is now acceptable from a planning perspective, subject to the conditions set out on page 113 of the agenda. Uh, so the recommendation is approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, I'm now going to go to Josie Gollinch for the public representation, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The first comment we have is from Stephen Graham. I and other residents object in the strongest possible terms to this proposal. This will have serious implications to the area and the residents have already had to endure the expansion of the school in tr increasing traffic noise and pollution levels. The volume of traffic and noise will increase up to at least 9 p.m. There are limited parking spaces in the school and the remainder will park in the street. This is the completely wrong location for this type of facility and should be situated away from residential areas, usually in secondary school where older pupils can take more advantage of the facility. This has been applied for on several occasions and rejected each time by local councillors. This is a commercial venture from which the school want to make money. This is against the terms of the loan they are to receive. The noise impact report gave the impression the school field was currently hired out and used on an evening. This is not true. The gates are locked on an evening and the field is not used and never has been. The predicted noise level from groups of adults shouting their reports states that this will be greater than the background noise and states that this should be avoided. There are bats in the area which are protected and will be affected by the light and noise pollution. Also, light to be shining directly into houses which is unacceptable. A letter from Dan Wilden of Pure Town Planning to Elizabeth Adams, it states that the MUGA is a facility for the benefit of the education and well-being of its pupils. This is not the case. The facility is a commercial venture operating outside school hours for the hiring by adults, etc. Also, this will be a small village facility and will not involve pay and play type hire. This facility is not conductive, conducive to a small village and will be a pay and play facility. The third party hire management plan document is a work of fiction added to the plan application after it had initially been declined. The school cannot even manage a parking policy on a daily basis. There is a complete disregard for the residents by this school. There is no confidence that the content of this document will be put into practice and is purely for this application. It appears that the adults will now be using the children's toilets and changing rooms and changing facilities. Does this not raise safeguarding issues? This proposed facility will be an inappropriate location and will result in a detriment to the residents and the neighbourhood. This should be located elsewhere without the resulting impact on residents in the community. The next comment is from Mario Massimino, who's the governor on behalf of St Ives' full governing body. The governing body enthusiastically supports this application for many reasons, but the most pressing and important is the contribution to the health of our young people and the local community that this facility will provide. 
Access to a wider range of sporting activities and with fewer disruptions due to weather will improve the physical, mental and social well-being and is vital at this current time. The governing body wishes to take advantage of the funding offered by Sport England who have assessed our school and believe St Ives will provide an outstanding sports facility to both children of our school and nursery as well as the wider community. We are proud that over the last 40 years our swimming pool has allowed additional sport and health benefits to so many children across Dorset and the wider community. The MUGA will offer the same opportunities. The MUGA has received overwhelming support from children and parents most of whom live within a two mile radius of the school. It is well known that the school has always placed sport and physical activity as an integral part of its curriculum and pupils are given the opportunity to take part in a wide range of activities, both in school time and as extra extracurricular clubs. Unfortunately, their ability to do this all year round is somewhat hampered by a school field that can often become waterlogged and means the offer to students becomes limited. This facility will allow extra we allow children to access these activities all year round and be able to take part in the extra fur further extracurricular clubs and new activities that cannot be delivered with the current facilities. Introduction to these new sports at a younger age may set up a spark that remains for life and encourages lifelong participation and the health and mental well-being benefits that it brings, something that is particularly prevalent in today's climate, with so many physical restrictions being placed on our young people and local community. As part of our due diligence process, we have spoken with a number of small, trusted local sports clubs and trainers, all of whom already work with the school. They have expressed interest in utilising the MUGA for bringing further benefit to our young people and community. The governing body are aware of the concerns of local residents and are committed to being a school at the heart of the community that works with those around us. We have listened to the concerns raised and we will continue to work with all stakeholders to ensure that the facility is well managed and brings benefits for all. The next comment is from Martin Kimberley, who's the Chief Executive of Active Dorset. The Dorset Play and Pitch Strategy, which was adopted by Dorset Council in 2019, assessed the two mini pitches at St Ives Primary School as being poor quality mini 5v5 pitches that are not available for the community use. The action plan sought to improve pitch quality as required for curricular and extracurricular demand. The current plans less accord with the council adopted strategy. The MUGA will bring benefits to the school pupils and staff, as well as the local community. There is a shortage of this type of MUGA in Dorset, which helps deliver government objectives of school being central to local communities and the creation of healthy, active lifestyles for local communities. The sports lighting is a crucial element to this development, allowing small games to be played during winter afternoons, as well as being able to be used by the local community from later, community from later September to late March in the evenings. I'm delighted that the school has been able to progress and secure funding to deliver the very much needed improvements that will allow curricular, extracurricular and community use. Active Dorset work to increase participation in sport and physical activity across the county, working closely with local government, health sector, education sector and the third sector to achieve that aim. We have seen that where high quality services can be accessed without the vagaries of water and daylight disrupting their use, the overall impact on the wellbeing of the users is a marked improvement. Other similar sites to this have benefited from the very directional sports lighting which now used and so the lights village which used to cause used to trouble neighbours has gone away. The school has the benefit of on-site parking which looks to be sufficient for any evening community use and this coupled with an early lights off time of 8.30 suggests they have gone to great lengths to consider how to minimise the impact on the local residents while still offering their community the undoubted benefit the MUGA will bring. At this time where acute hospital hospital trusts are reporting significant increase in child deconditioning leading to more admissions for conditions relating to sedentary behaviour, growing waiting lists for musculoskeletal conditions in adults, low level mental health conditions rising sharply and a desire to reduce travel by car, the need for good quality, lo very local facilities that services the casual participant is ever growing. I hope that the committee supports the great benefits of this project which will improve the well-being of both the school pupils and the local community. The next comment is from the agent Dan Wilden, Director of Pure Town Planning. We are delighted to finally bring this application before Planning Committee with an officer recommendation to grant planning permission. Members will be aware from the committee papers that the school has worked hard to deal with the various issues arising in the process of the application. The principle of the proposed development has the support of planning policy. The main question comes down to whether the proposal will have an acceptable impact on the local environment and nearby residents. Some local residents have been considered concerned that the proposed pitch would become a major commercial enterprise, 
This is not the case. The proposed pitch is predominantly for the school to use during school hours, but it will also complement existing extracurricular sport and activities and be made available on a carefully managed basis to the wider community. This would be to the vetted and established sport providers and clubs only. To give confidence that the pitch will be well managed by the school, we have drawn up a detailed management plan with the officer, which your officer has proposed to be a condition of the plan and permission. This deals with matters such as vetting potential hires, parking, noise and lighting. The most frequent concern raised locally has been about parking. We understand that, as with most schools these days, there are tensions around parking, particularly parents dropping off and picking up. But the pitch will not add capacity to the school and so will not alter the numbers arriving or departing at the start or the end of school day. After school hours, as set out in the management plan, the on-site parking will be available to users. Notably, the Highways Authority has raised no objection to the proposal. The other key local concerns are around noise and lighting and the school has worked with your authority's environmental health team to ensure that the impacts are acceptable and manageable. The original hours of use have been cut back to 8.30pm. The school commissioned a noise study, the recommendations of which have been included in the management plan. To reduce noise, the perimeter fencing is to be soft ball stop netting rather than a chain link fence and there have to be no hard backboards. The latest directional lighting is to be used and a detailed lights fill plan was produced which has satisfied your envi environmental health officer that the lighting, when in use, would not have a disturbing impact on nearby residents. I trust members will recognise the lengths which the school has gone through to ensure the impact of the proposed pitch would be acceptable in order that the very great benefits to the health of the children and the wider community can be realised. Thank you. That's all the comments for this application. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, ward members uh, here today for this application. Uh, Barry Gorringe is a member of the committee, so I will come to him during the debate. Uh, the other local member is Ray Bryan, who I understand wishes to speak. Ray, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. And can I congratulate the officers uh, in the way they've dealt with some of the issues that have been raised? Sadly, it doesn't solve all the issues and I have a number of issues uh, that I need to raise. When people buy their properties, they're aware of the current conditions uh, in the surrounding area. The development proposal will change those current conditions, uh, which could have a detrimental effect on the properties surrounding it. I take issue with the report on the 2007 open space. The Parish Council have enhanced facilities at both Brayside Road and um, the Horton Road. Um, so, and in addition to that, of course, we have both Moores Valley and Avon Heath Country Park, which provide thousands of acres of open space. One of the big problems I have is going to be covering the, uh, uh, the parking issue, which is a nightmare situation uh, outside the school uh, during the uh, uh, the school term. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have is that people uh, or parents drop off their children outside the school uh, and unfortunately, uh, um, uh, contrary to everything I'm trying to do, leave their engines running while they take the children in. That's not part of this proposal, but I thought I'd just drop it in. Um, one of the things that I think we need to, to, to look at is um, where the extra people are going to come from that will use this at night time. The Parish Council uh, promote and support a youth club at Brayside Road, where attendances by young teenagers are at best very low, sometime into single figures. Whilst I'm in favour of enhancing the facilities for the school, I have reservations again about the use of outside groups, which is which is without question being done on a commercial basis. This will encourage an increase in both traffic and noise and encourage people taking longer journeys to get to these facilities. I'd like to pass some comments on the report itself. At the moment, the suggestion is that instead of it being a 10 o'clock finish, which it was originally, this has been reduced to 8.30. I would ask the committee to consider lowering that even further or at least giving some res respite to the neighbours by having certain days when it's not allowed. I'm also interested in on page 101 of the report, 
um, the scheduling of any hardball sports. We all know that on the hardball sports, this will create um, intermittent noise, which will create disturbance and is becoming more noticeable. Um, I also refer to the amount of residents that have complained or objected to this report or to, to this planning consent. Um, I also note the amount of support they got, but one would expect that because a lot of people are, in, uh, are, are going to be voting with their feet in favour uh, because the, they are already involved with the, uh, the facility. As I say, I've got a big issue with parking on the road. Um, I note the comment that they'll allow the car parking to be off the road. Um, it still doesn't alter the fact that we're encouraging lots of extra people to travel by car to a facility when we have alternative facilities within the close proximity. Um, page 105 of, the, uh, of your report um, is the impact on the character of the area. I, I still believe we have a major uh, issue on that and the impact on the neighbouring amenity. I, I don't believe we've, we've actually dealt with any with those. Um, I'm concerned that we're, we're trying to encourage uh, um, sort of more mature students to attend something that is a first school. Uh, as I understand it, um, a first school is for younger children uh, and we're trying to encourage uh, outside uh, the area uh, to, to, to come in and, and use this facility. Um, it's interesting to note that they point the fact that uh, uh, the swimming pool has been enhanced. Can I just point out that that was done with financial support uh, from the previous East Dorset Council um, who have always supported the school. Um, I, I, I go back to 8.13 on page 107 where they expect that the proposed new MUGA uh, will not significantly uh, alter the current usage. I do raise issue with that because if it wasn't going to, uh, uh, if it's not envisaged to raise the current uh, usage, then we can curtail it to the hours that the school uh, uh, work within. Um, and I'm just going to make one last point, um, which is because of the event of more traffic movements, uh, it is against the declared climate change and ecological proposed strategy. Um, and as I say, I would like, I would ask the committee if they're looking at accepting uh, this uh, proposal, then they look at the hours of usage. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, I will pass back to the officers for comments, but um, as you are aware, the committee can only give a limited amount of weight to something that is not a formal policy of the council. Uh, Liz, do you wish to respond to any of the comments that have been made, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in respect of the um, the concerns about encouraging more people into the area, um, we also have to consider how far people might currently be travelling to reach a similar facility as this. So uh, there is there is always going to be some element of people travelling, um, but as the schools already said, a lot of the pupils live within two miles of the school. When they go to secondary school, one would presume they're unlikely to have all moved house. So um, whilst I appreciate that there is limited uptake on the youth offer um, in the vicinity, I would suggest that this sporting offer is quite different. And also it's not just for young people, is it? It's for all members of society. Um, there are a lot of adult clubs that may be interested. Um, we can't um, uh, we can't be specific about who can use this facility. The idea is that it is for the community and that it would be used by different sports clubs um, who um, will provide new opportunities or relocated opportunities that might be um, more easily accessed by people who live in the area. Um, in terms of the parking, I appreciate um, from 
the letters that have been received by the council that there is an issue in terms of traffic um, associated with the school. Obviously, um, we are looking here at a provision of a facility where there's going to be quite limited numbers of people on the using the pitch at any one time. So um, whilst it might be seen to ex exacerbate existing problems, um, I would suggest that um, the opportunities that have been um, secured by the school to provide off off road parking for the use of this facility outside of school hours would mean that this is a different issue to the one that is currently um, a, um, a con of concern to, to local residents. Um, in terms of um, hardball scheduling, um, there's limited um, it, it, limited opportunity for the council to have control over that but the school have expressed their desire and their intention to try to schedule hardball activities earlier in the evening to try and limit the ball um, noise it, noises that might arise. Obviously the noise impact assessment has said that the main noises do arise from, from people um, from voices of those playing on the pitch so um, and, and they've taken the ball noises into consideration when um, when judging that there would be a minor impact and that it, it would be um, an acceptable level. Um, I think in terms of the character of the area, the, the school is a noise generating use. Um, obviously, the, uh, being a primary school, there are times when you would ex anticipate that, that that noise would be louder or would be quieter. Um, although neighbours have explained that they've never seen the, the field being used in the evenings by our people in the community, that is an option to the school. So um, we as officers have considered what the impact is going to be. We've, we've acknowledged that there will be some change to the character of the area, but in terms of planning policies, um, the proposal is considered to be acceptable. I hope that helps. Um, if I may just interject as well, Kim Cowell here, um, Madam Chairman, if I may just refer members to the MPPF um, and um, Chapter 8 um, and Paragraph 92, um, it's just a reminder that um, in terms of promoting healthy and safe communities, the MPPF um, makes provision for um, social, recreational, cultural facilities to service the community needs as a whole and it specifies that planning policies and decisions should plan positively for the provision and use of shared spaces, community facilities. Um, it then goes on to list meeting places, sports venues, etc. Um, and other local services to enhance the sustainability of communities and residential environments um, and to take into account and support the delivery of local strategies to improve health, social and cultural well-being for all sections of the community. Um, and um, the officer report's been um, written with that in mind as well. Thank you very much. Hmm. Councillor Coombs, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you, sorry. Um, I'm now going to say thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and I'm now going to move on to the members that wish to speak. I do have quite a long list, uh, but my first speaker is the other local member, Barry Gorringe. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, Liz Adams, for the uh, very good presentation today. Um, in, in, in the interest of openness and uh, transparency regarding this application, I, I am, as you've already said, the local um, Dorset uh, ward member. I'm also a member of the parish council, but I'm not a member of the planning committee at the parish council, and therefore I've not been involved in any meetings at all with regard to this application or the debating of the application. Um, so therefore I've made no determination, and therefore I do consider myself able to debate today on this application. Um, as as we've seen in point 602, um, yes, there's been 71 um, objections to the original application with a further 32 to the amended uh, application. So you, you, you get a good feeling that there's um, a, a very strong case here um, with regard to this application to, to uh, reject it. 
I mean, personally, myself, I think that I've nearly had 71 phone calls and emails from residents regarding this application, even to the fact that um, when I've been out doing my daily walking in the in the lockdown, I've even been stopped by residents in the street. So it does show that there is a lot of um, opinion about this particular application. Now, um, going on to um, Heskus Close, which is, um, as you can see on the block plan, is the um, is actually down the bottom end of the site. Now, um, there are a lot of uh, families there with young children, and I do have grave concerns about the the timing of this of being open to 8.30 in the evening. I, I must concur with um, my colleague, uh, Councillor Brian, with regard to this. Um, and also the fact that uh, is Sundays, it's open on, it's going to be used on Sundays as well. Well, I think there ought to be at least one day a week. If this is going to be approved, there ought to be at least one day a week when the, the, the residents should have some kind of respite. Um, going on to paragraph um, four, uh, 814 in the presentation, it states that the local policy HA, HE2 requires development should be a secure, acceptable, relationship to nearby properties, including minimising general disturbance to the amenities. Uh, quite honestly, I don't think that's going to happen with this particular application. Um, as I say, I do concur with a lot of the things that uh, Councillor Bryan has said in his, in his uh, speech, so I'm not going to go over all of them, but um, I will say that um, over the past years, I have fully supported the school in, in their fundraising and projects. But I think on this occasion that um, I can't actually support this um, application. But um, nevertheless, I will be interested to hear what um, the rest of the committee members have to say. So uh, that's all I have to say at this time, except one other thing that um, I note in Mr Graham, his letter to the uh, council, he did say that uh, he's never seen the school field being used in the evening. And as I only lives half a mile from the school, I can concur with that as well. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Barry. I'm going to move on to our next speaker, and that's John Worth. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to add sort of some context to this because um, some years ago in Chickrell, we had a multi-use games area um, constructed for the primary school um, and it is in a very similar situation. It is surrounded by houses on on three sides. Um, it is flood lit. It is open till 10 p.m. at night, uh, seven days a week um, for local residents to use. Um, we don't actually have any controls on who uses it and when they use it outside of the normal school hours. Um, and to my knowledge, we haven't been bombarded at the town council with complaints about this facility. In fact, most of the residents who did have some concerns have expressed that their concerns were never came to fruition and they're not disturbed by either the light or um, excess noise um, during their, you know, the evenings or, or at weekends. So I just thought I'd, I'd say that there is a very similar situation within my own ward um, and it's it's been well used and uh, it is an enhanced facility for everybody. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, my next speaker is Brian Heatley. Thank you, Chair. Um, this application comes down to the balance of the harm arising from the changed character of the school site and the benefits that come from the exercise people will get it on it. And, and I mean, we've heard a lot of very real things which will be um, disturbances to the neighbourhood, and I don't think we can minimise those. I think we've heard rather less, or at least we've heard, heard rather uh, less specifically about the benefits on the other side. And in particular, we, although we've heard quite a lot about young people, We've not heard anything much about old people, so I'm going to put a little bit of personal experience into this. Uh, I was I was sad to read that um, one of the 
strains in the objections was that the people who live around this site, many of them are, are elderly and they don't see any personal use for it. My life has been transformed in the last five years by taking part in one of the fastest growing sports in Britain at the moment, which is called walking football, which is football played by people over 50, mainly alas men. Uh, and it is it has been transformative in terms of my own attitudes and fitness and equally of the people I play with. And I'm I'm sure it will have long term benefits in terms of dementia and all sorts of other things. Now, pitches like this are of immense benefit for a sport like that. Um, when you get older, you want to play on a pitch which is predictable. And you know how it's going to behave and it's going to behave the same way all the time to avoid injury. Uh, and it is the existence of a venue which is incredibly important to the growth of sports ventures of this kind. So it's not just children, it's older people as well. And we must we mustn't lose sight of the benefits of this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my next speaker is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I've got a question for the officer and then I'd like to come back afterwards, please. Um, so I'm I'm no expert on on Mooga um, pitches and I noticed that uh, page 108 at 8.17 Sport England data says that um, it's, it's been looked into and to, to predict the noise levels of these typical types of sports facilities um, in association with football, hockey and rugby. And I was just wondering whether this surface afforded itself to basketball and netball. Um, the reason I asked the question is because some years ago I had um, experience of uh, basketball being played into the early hours of the morning um, and it, the sound of the ball hitting the hard surface reverberated through the house as we know at night noise tends to travel that much further and uh, it really felt like it was being played next door and I'm mindful of the fact that the, the nearest dwelling is only 30 metres away so I'd just like some clarification around that please as to whether or this is a type of surface that where netball and basketball could be played on it. Thank you through you chair. Um, so the reference to the typical sports um, being uh, football, hockey and rugby, I think are because hockey is particularly noisy with the um, noise of the ball against the, um, the hockey bat and against the sideboards. Um, so my understanding is that both netball and basketball could potentially be played on this surface, although with the removal of the right to use backboards, it's unlikely that basketball would be um, or it would be considered an appropriate facility for basketball. But um, yes, I do envisage that netball would be um, used on the on the MUGA and um, that the noise levels would be um, below or similar to those identified by Sport England. OK. OK, if I may, if I may come back to Madam Chairman, um, I I take on board the, the parish council's concern over this site and I take on board the ward members concern on this site. But as Brian Heatley so succinctly put it, it is weighing up the balance between what disturbance it would be to the residents and what beneficial gain there would be to the to the local residents and to the greater public in general. And I think um, as as the officer has pointed out within the MPF MPPF document in terms of the health and well-being and as part of our corporate plan in terms of health and well-being, I think these types of sites need to be give, given serious consideration. Um, while it's possibly not ideal, I don't think it is um, leans itself to that much of a uh, disturbance to the local neighbours. They might feel differently about that. I am concerned about the 30 metre distance and as I say, netball or basketball being played and whether something could be put into the planning conditions on this, I don't know. But I think in the benefits it could bring to the community, particularly to children and to young adults, and I'm, I'm in favour of that. I'm, I'm also reminded of the uh, walking football that Councillor Heatley expressed earlier, which I'd actually forgotten about that, but I am reminded of that. So it would be an all age facility potentially. Um, I think it gives another 
uh, outlook to the local amenities with the area. They seem to be fairly well provisioned for, but this is an, an additional to that. And I think these types of facilities do need to be embedded close into our community so that children particularly can have the greatest use of them. They don't have to travel great distances for it. So I think, Madam Chairman, on the whole, I am in favour of this. I would like whether or not we could add some other planning conditions to it, um, particularly in, in relation to the, the basketball and netball issue, um, should it transpire that, that that could present a significant issue to being a, deter a detrimental impact on the local residents. And I'd also wondered whether or not we could put in a planning condition in terms of the opening times. Um, and that could be reviewed after one year and left open to have a review, an ongoing review on that on the opening time, should it prove to be a significant disturbance to local residents. As Councillor Worth has said in Trickerall, that there was um, extreme concerns when they put their mooger in there, but as it transpired, those fears didn't actually come to pass. And I think that may well be a similar situation that we would have here. So I think, Madam Chairman, I'm going to propose that we go with the officer recommendation provided we're able to put those other planning conditions in. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Liz to come back on those two points, which is about the types of sport and the opening times review. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, in terms of netball, I'd say that that's more of a, a throwing sport than a bouncing. I think it's the bouncing that is the concern, isn't it, with the, the ball hitting the, the surface. Yeah. Um, it, I'd, so I'd say it wouldn't really be reasonable to, to limit netball. Um, with basketball, as I've already said, I don't think it's going to be um, suitable for basketball if no backboards are going to be permitted. So I think we've already kind of discounted basketball by the removal of the backboards, although it could still be used by um, during the day by the, the school children to, to practice. Um, but again, because the noise um, impact assessment has suggested that there's no significant harm, I think it wouldn't be reasonable to impose that condition. Um, that's that's your officer opinion. In terms of the opening times, um, at present the proposal is for use every day between 9 and 8.30. Um, if you have a particular reason why you think that it needs to be more limited, then that is your your gift to, to impose an alternative. The um, there's two issues, aren't there? The, the one is that in order to get the maximum community benefit, then you'd want the MUGA to be open um, for opportunities for the community. Um, and it, those potentially could be quite limited if you're going to take out, say, the whole of Sunday. Or um, And the other thing is um, it would be difficult to suggest that the t times could change unless only a temporary permission was given. Yeah, as I say, I, I wasn't in position actually taking the day. I, I agree that there needs to be, sorry, Madam Chairman, through you, that there needs to be maximum use of the facility if the facility is going in. And so I wouldn't envisage actually taking a day out. I would I would like something in the plan condition to say that the opening hours in the evening could be subject to review on an ongoing basis. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I, planning conditions have to be precise um so that's my concern about the suggested the review okay. um so yeah. okay so conforming to planning law as planning law is then i'm still happy to to propose it madam chairman thank you i did my best okay can i just be clear so you are proposing grant as per the officer recommendation oh yeah yeah okay thank you uh i have a variety of speakers um John Worth wants to come back and second the proposal. I th think I'll allow that first of all, John, very quickly. Yeah. You've already spoken. Yeah, um, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, second uh, Councillor Bartlett's proposal um, that we go along with the uh, officer's recommendations on this. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm now going to move on to my next speaker, and that's Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would, I am always very um, aware of parish council's opinions because they do tend to be the people who harvest local opinions. So I am um, 
rather undecided about this one, but my instinct is that we spend a lot of time allowing new houses and less time allowing for facilities and activities which would service those houses. And so I actually would like better facilities and like many se several other councillors, I have experience of a Mooga in my ward, which is actually well used. It's I think it's slightly smaller than this one. It's half the size of that one, but it's actually quite well used by actual parish councillors in a veterans football evening. Uh, so nothing is we always worry about teenagers using things, but if it is a facility that is used by all ages, it would be a great village facility. And so I am slightly, um, what's the word, on the fence on this one. Uh, I would ask, there doesn't appear to be any conditions that would actually encourage planting around the perimeter, inside the perimeter of shrubs, which might help to mitigate the sound um, because they do act as white noise and suppress sort of um, irritating noise. So I wondered if the, it was possible to put in a condition that the planting around the perimeter, particularly between the um, the pitch and Hesketh Close could be bumped up, thickened, encouraged. Thank you. I think you mute, Chairman. Oh, typical, sorry, I had to do it at some point, didn't I? Um, I was going to say that I assume then you'd be suggesting a landscaping condition which would then be delegated to officers because we don't have anything before us if members uh, decide to approve the application this morning. Liz, would you like to respond please? Thank you Madam Chair. Um, landscaping was condition, um, was con considered quite early on in, in this um, scheme uh, because we were looking at whether you could mitigate the impact successfully and um, the reason why we haven't suggested a condition is because of the school playing field nature of the, the site so um, there are benefits in the site um, having um, being able to be seen easily and there's also benefits um, in terms of um, limiting the amount of maintenance and um, potential loss of, of school field due to the, due to the landscaping. So that's that those are the reasons why your officers didn't consider that a landscaping scheme was was considered appropriate in this case, because in order to, to mitigate effectively, you'd have to have quite a high screen, which obviously is already available um, to the benefit along um, along the verge. But at the moment, um, this uh, western boundary is is hedging um, relatively low so that the um, the people living in, in the flats and the houses have the benefit of some um, some views across the playing field um, the potential growing of, of tall trees which will be necessary to mitigate the visual or, or audio um, audio impacts um, would have to be significant and, and then would potentially have harmful impacts on on outlook um, so I can see um, the attraction of asking for a landscaping scheme but from an officer point of view um, it wasn't considered to offer the benefits in this instance. Okay I'm going to come back to you Alex. Um, I, I accept the officer's um, uh, comments on that. Um, I always like it possibly the school might itself let the hedge grow up a little bit taller over the years um, but basically I'm in favour of more facilities so thank you very much. Thank you very much Alex. Uh, my next speaker is Julie Robinson. Thank you Madam Chairman. 
we have a Mooga slap bang in the middle of my ward at Trickett's Cross and it's so well used by people of most ages. The difference with this one um, at St Ives is that it's going to be more controlled. It's within a school. Um, they are going to be doing um, letting out, shall we say, for um, the elderly or whatever, but it's more controlled, whereas ours isn't. It's just basically with ours, you just rock up. So I will be supporting this application because I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my next speaker is David Took. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think this is uh, on balance. Uh, as Councillor Gorringe said earlier, it is a matter of balance. <clears throat> and I think this is a great, a great idea. Uh, in terms of restricting use uh, to a number of hours, as, as Councillor Bartlett was talking earlier, um, the officer's response was that conditions need to be precise. And I think I accept that, but would it be possible perhaps to condition it so that on a Sunday uh, this was only available between, for example, the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m.? We should give the residents some respite uh, in evenings and early mornings on a on a traditional day of rest. And would that be precise enough? Is is that would it be possible to uh, add that as a condition alongside the current condition of restricting the hours from nine to eight thirty? That would be possible. Um, there are two ways of doing that. The first one is to ask the proposer and second if they would be happy to incorporate that into their proposal so that uh, six days a week it would be the timings as per the officer report but on Sundays the time would be reduced from 10 till 6. Are the proposer and second are happy to incorporate that? Yes Madam Chair, I'm happy to incorporate that. It would give some respite to residents should there be a, a, an issue with it, but I, I don't think there will be. But yeah, I'm happy to incorporate that. OK, and John yeah. Worth, are you happy? I'm happy to incorporate that. Uh, I don't think it will be an issue, but yes, I'm, I'm happy to incorporate that in the uh, planning conditions. OK, so okay. otherwise we'd have to go through a torturous route of getting seconders and multiple votes and so on. So OK, David, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I, I, with that in place, I, I think this is a great idea. Thank you. And my final speaker is David Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Now I've worked out how to uh, get the chat bar working, um, thanks to a previous meeting we had. Um, yes, as an ex-teacher, uh, and I've obviously had experience of these uh, Mugas because I was in a school where we had one. I was thinking of the benefit to the school because pitches are, are all right in the summer, but very often in winter they get waterlogged. The use of this MUGA means that uh, facilities for the school particularly can be used all the year round um, because the likelihood of it getting water flooded is, uh, is very remote. So it does open up uh, quite a few activities that can be done in the winter which couldn't otherwise be done. I appreciate what the residents feel um, about it and they may find that the uh, possible noise uh, and their objections uh, may not be as uh, severe as they feel uh, and as we've already heard very often the people who are objecting to it are very often the people who might make use of it. Uh, so um, the only other thing that would worry me is um, I appreciate the, the car park can be used or the school car park can be used. I just hope that the school is going to be secure enough uh, if there is any damage and the damage isn't done to the school itself. But I'm sure uh, the area it is, I'm uh, sure that's not going to happen. 
But I'm thinking of the school's benefit. It will be of great benefit to the school uh, in, in their sports activities, which of course we're trying to encourage. So I support the uh, application. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm sure uh, any issues of damage will be down to how well uh, the scheme would be managed. So um, I have no more speakers, so I will now put it to the vote. Uh, the, it has been proposed and seconded for grant as per the officer recommendation with an additional condition 11, um, which controls the use on a Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. only. Madam Chair, may I interrupt? That's Liz Adams. Yeah. May, may I suggest that rather than adding another condition, we just alter condition seven? Thank you. That's fine. Yes, absolutely. So, members, uh, I will now proceed to the vote with uh, that change. So, going back to the roll call. Uh, first member is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I've listened to all of the officers report and I've taken part in all of the debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. Alex Brenton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have listened to the whole debate. I have understanding of the issues, but gen on balance, I am voting for. Thank you. Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I've followed the presentation in full and listened to the debate, and I'm happy to support uh, the recommendation to grant. Thank you. Mike Dyer? Uh, I've been present throughout, listened to the debate, and I'm abstaining. OK. Barry Gorringe? Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I've listened to the debate and the presentation. Um, as I said when I spoke, um, I've always supported the school in the past, but uh, on this occasion, I'm going to be uh, supporting the resident, so I'm against the application. Thank you. Brian Heatley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've been present for the whole debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. David Morgan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've heard all the debate and I am voting for. Thank you. Judy Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've heard all of the debate and I am voting for. Thank you. David Took. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to all of the debate and on balance, I am voting for. Thank you. Bill Trite. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've um, <clears throat> listened to everything that has been said in this debate, including that by the local members, and particularly in respect of weight to be attached to the latter. On balance, I am therefore voting against the recommendation. OK, thank you. And finally, John Worth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I've been present throughout to participate in the debate and support the um, application for approval. Thank you. OK, so David Northover, can you give me the outcome of the vote, please? Chairman, I, I can. It's eight four two against one abstention. OK, so that then is carried. So the planning application has been approved with the um, change to condition seven uh, as regard to hours of use on a Sunday. Thank you all very much for your contribution to that one. I shall now move on to our final application today. And that is 6 2020 a full application. Alterations to existing building to form additional ground floor, one bedroom flat. <coughs> Can you turn your microphones off, please? Uh, and reduce the size of shop unit and installation of roof lights to south elevation to serve the shop at 86 Wareham Road, Lichitma Travers. And that is on pages 117 to 132 of your agenda. And taking us through this application again is Liz Adams. Over to you, Liz. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So 
this application, which will hopefully appear before us, uh, comes before you members due to objections raised by the Parish Council to loss of part of the retail facility that uh, is on the site. Your officer's recommendation is approval. Lichima Travers lies in the former Purbeck area. And the site lies in the settlement and it's surrounded by residential properties with the primary school being opposite in the Greenbelt. This is an extract from the neighbourhood plan, which indicates communal assets within the locality. Um, the application site is number 12 that I've outlined in yellow there. And the main retail provision allocated in the Purbeck local plan is the Purbeck Parade, um, which is seen here in the Google Street View. So you've got Tesco, which provides a local convenience store, and there are two other shops in the parade. The settlement also has two public houses, uh, the Rose and Crown, and at number 11 there, and a Chequers public house at number one. So the application site was formerly a butcher's convenience store, but in 2017, following planning committee refusal, permission was granted at appeal for a replacement building, including a ground floor shop, which you see here, um, and coffee shop, and four flats together with a single storey building to the rear to provide two additional flats. And subsequently, a revised scheme, um, which is actually what we see here, sorry, is um, was granted permission in 2018. And this was for a replacement building similar to that approved at Appeal, but slightly wider, which was to provide the four flats and a shop again, slightly smaller shop. Um, the, this development is now completed, uh, except for some landscaping at the front and back, um, at the bin store and three parking spaces at the front of the building. So the parish council has raised concerns about the development taking place on site other than in accordance with approved plans and has requested that enforcement actually be taken. Um, whilst the incomplete parking represents a breach of condition, as the shop is yet to be utilised, it would not be reasonable to take enforcement action at this stage. And the issues with landscaping have been brought to the applicant's attention for remedial action. The Parish Council has suggested that developers have a tendency to rely upon retrospective permission and that action should be taken to prevent any development other than that authorised. But the developer is aware that any works they undertake other than those with permission are at their own risk and um, prior to the determination of the current application. And this can't um, prejudice the determination of the application itself. So enforcement action could be taken in the future if this is necessary to secure compliance with conditions, but this has not been judged appropriate to date. Um, the parking for the four flats is all in place and the flats are occupied. Uh, I should say that this um, element uh, has subsequently had separate planning permission for two semi-detached dwellings and those are also completed and occupied. The determination of this application will influence the completion works yet to be undertaken on the site. So here we see the new building. Uh, within the street seeing the building set back from the highway, um, similar to number 84 and the bungalows to the south. So photo three is from the summer when the site was being marketed. Um, the other photos are all more recent. It's understood that the parish council would wish the previous convenience store use of the site to continue in the new shop. But under the extant planning consent um, and following changes to the national use classes order, the front part of the ground floor could at this point be used as a shop or by any for any other use under the new use class E. And that includes um, restaurants, financial and professional services, indoor sport, recreational fitness, um, health or medical services, creation nursery or day centre um, for visiting members of the public, as offices, as research and development or any industrial process that can be carried out in the residential area. So it's a very broad spectrum of uses that are now permitted in that, in that area um, within the unit. Uh, the Parish Council has referred to the Council's ability to remove permitted development rights via an Article 4 direction, but this would not prevent alternative uses to the unit as changes within use class do not represent development, unless there is a specific condition which there isn't on this site. So the proposal is to amend the approved ground floor layout to provide an additional flat 
and a much smaller shop unit. Um, the parking would also be amended so that this space would be for the flat and the two spaces would be retained for the shop. The Parish Council has objected to the scheme due to concerns about the viability of the modest shop floor area and the perceived need to retain the shop on the site. The Village Parade is um, in the area identified by the Perbic Local Plan for Protection of Retail Assets under Policy RP. But the Litchim and Travers Neighbourhood Plan seeks to support and protect existing shopping facilities throughout the settlement. So policy seven of the Neighbourhood Plan is relevant and this states that proposals were, that would result in the loss of sites used or last used for local shopping facilities will not be supported unless it can be demonstrated that there is no reasonable prospect of viable continued use for similar shopping or community uses. And this is by having marketed at a reasonable price the unit for at least nine months. So the applicant has provided evidence that the shop coffee shop has been marketed since January 2019 without success. The local property agents have explained to the council that the size of the shop results in market rents which are too large for the village location, but that interest has been shown in a smaller unit as is now sought for shop use. Your officers consider that the applicants have met the requirements of policy 7 and the Perbit Local Plan Policy RP. The unit has been marketed but it's been shown to be too large for the locality. The proposal would retain a unit that can be used for retail on the site, albeit smaller than the previous provision. Um, other concerns raised about the proposal related to the impacts on neighbouring amenity. So the extant planning permission requires that the windows in the side elevation that would have served the shop um, would be obscure glazed to avoid overlooking into the windows on the side elevation of number 84. The proposal now would remove obscure glazing from the top pane of the window which is now proposed to serve a bedroom. Three roof lights would also be added to the smaller shop unit but these would have no impact on neighbouring amenities at their high level. So here we see the relationship between this um, a supposed to be obscure glazed shop window and the adjoining flat at number 88. Uh, the clear glazed window, which would be this pane here, would be opposite the obscure glazed door and small obscure glazed window of num serving number 88. And there's sufficient um, oblique um, angle to avoid um, harmful levels of overlooking between the two ground floor windows. In addition, there is the possibility that screening could be erected to help to minimise this, although due to the um, location on the axis which leads down to the house at the back, this is unlikely. So officers have carefully considered whether the overlooking is acceptable and have considered that no harm would arise. The new one bed unit meets national floor space requirements and heat of the mitigation will be secured via community infrastructure levy. Uh, the residential use is compatible within the residential context. No highway concerns have been raised as two parking spaces would be retained for use by the shop and there are on street parking opportunities. So in summary, the principle of development is considered acceptable because it's been demonstrated that the existing shop unit is not viable. The scale design and the impact on neighbouring amenity are all considered to be acceptable. No impact has been identified in relation to highway safety and car parking and drainage impacts can be, um, well, they're already secured by conditions on the existing permission. So um, the officer recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions set out in paragraph 18 of the committee report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, I'm now going to go to Chelsea Gorringe. Sorry, Chelsea, I pronounced your name wrong. Um, to read out the public representation. Chelsea, you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> The representation we've received is from Simon Morgan, who's the Managing Director for Morgan Design Studio Limited. Good afternoon, my name is Simon Morgan and I'm the Architectural Consultant and Plan Agent for this application. It is important to note that this application is recommended for approval with conditions and that all planning policy requirements and officer comments addressed and their support given. 
The history of the development on this site is well documented and the build is now complete. The flats have been occupied for some time now and the whole site is now settling into the local character settling well. The reason for the change to the shop layout is simple. When the original site was purchased in 2016, there was a butcher's shop in converted premises. The business had fallen on difficult times and as such had closed, all as was documented in the original approval. However, to retain some form of employment, the scheme developed and retained a shop frontage in the hope that business would move in. But now, some four years later, requirements for shops are in the decline and no suitable interested parties have come forward, despite marketing by one of the leading agents in Dorset. Even as potential office space, there has been no interest. The houses to the rear are now occupied and the sales of the flats have proved popular with all of them occupied too. However, the sale of the shop unit has not been successful. With the pandemic and lockdown restrictions and with the restrictions on retail units and social distancing, many shops and businesses are reassessing their position in semi-rural areas like this. Two letters from Austin and Wyatt and Tony Newman, estate agents, are attached for reference but the reduced retail unit as indicated in this application has generated much better interest and the applicant is in advanced legal discussions with a suitable party and is hoped that occupation will take place during early 2021. The new ground floor flat has been designed to avoid any direct overlooking and during the application process with some minor amendments has received support from the neighbours and plan officers. So to conclude this application meets all policy requirements it is supported by the plan department and professional consultees it follows the principles of the scheme approved by the previous approval and will create a cohesive, comprehensive development that will preserve the character of the area. I trust, therefore, that following your debate, the committee will make the correct decision and grant plan approval. Thank you for your time. That's the only comment we've received for this. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Um, we do have three local ward members uh, that relate to this application. Uh, the first one, Alex Brunton, is a member of the committee, so I'll, I will come to you shortly. Uh, Bill Pipe has not indicated that he wishes to attend and speak. However, Andrew Starr does. So, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm Andrew Starr, as you as you say, uh, one of the members for Upton and Lichit. Um the planning permission, as you've heard, the planning permission on this site originally envisaged a shop and a cafe, and both of which would have been constituted, constituted much, need, much needed amenities in an area of a growing village that will itself be accommodating much of that growth. Bishop Matravers has a good local plan that calls for just such amenities. At present, there is just one small supermarket situated at a considerable distance from from the site and no cafe uh, i believe uh, although i live in upton i am very f f familiar with the site itself as I, I take my granddaughter to the, the school opposite every day i believe that the developer has a history of changing plans between planning and, and consent and and completing the development it would be very nice if we could rely on the planning permission given being the same as the development when it finally sees itself in, in actual bricks and mortar. Unless there is a very good reason, and I'm not convinced that this is the so, so in this case. So I'm mostly concerned about the fact that these, this amenity, I believe, is much, much used, especially as there's going to be some more, quite a lot more um, development in the, the, the near. Uh, vicinity and it, it, I'm sure that most people if they want a, 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 a pint of milk or something they're going to get their car to go either to the to to the other end of the village or they end up going down to Poole or Upton or something and you need with the amount of development that will be going on here you need some local shops which I don't think this will provide in the um, in the way it's presented now. Thank you chair. Thank you very much, Andrew. So I'm going to go back to um, the officers. Do you wish to respond to any of the comments that have been made by the public speakers? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I have anything to add to the presentation at this stage. OK, thank you. Um, I'm now going to go to members of the committee. Uh, Alex Brenton, you are the other local member. Do you wish to speak? Yes, Chair, please. 
floor is yours. Um, first of all, I am concerned because I know the parish council has actually written a deposition, which I understand was emailed across on Sunday. So I'm surprised it's not being read out because they sent it to me and I said, fair enough, make sure it's in by 8.30. Um, has, nothing has arrived. I think I'll ask him to respond to that one. I'm going to um, David Northover. Um, Sorry, can you I please should, yeah. confirm when the when it was received. Thank you. Yes, chair. Yes, chairman. Um, it was re it was received after the eight thirty deadline on the Monday. Oh. Yes. Do we? Can I ask whether we have any uh, members of the public from Lichit, Lichit Parish Council actually on this um, meeting? Do we, can we find that? Do we know that at all? Whether they are or not, they do not have the opportunity to make any representation to the meeting. They can only sit and listen because the representation was received out of time. Oh dear. OK, um, right. In I that cannot... case. Sorry, Chairman no, and Councillor Brenton, if I may assist. Um, Liz, in her presentation, has has had regard to what the Parish Council said originally, and she's tried to cover those issues in the presentation to you this morning. So I hope that 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 helps. Thank you, Kim. I'll come back to you now, Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a site I know very well, having been have, uh, seeing I drive past it regularly and I used to frequent the, the previous shop on the premises, which didn't so much run into hard time as the owners uh, got old and infirm with um, health problems and then gave up. So it wasn't that it was failing at the time it was sold. This is a village which is quite scattered, like many that have been developed sort of slightly haphazardly, but the parish has pulled itself together and has got a, a quite definite neighbourhood plan which has been agreed and adopted by Dorset. Um, there is one uh, small Tesco's in the middle of the up by the crossroads, but around the school on the other side of the road there are 200 houses and another 95 planned literally a couple of hundred yards away from this and therefore this area is an area which logically should have uh, commercial facilities you know shop or something um, and it is very concerning that very small that this shop has been this uh, this application shrinks the shop if you look at the plan to a very tiny sliver. Now, this tiny sliver in this day and age of wanting to space out when going shopping, I don't know how you would get uh, more than say two customers at the very most in a shop that size. This is the size of the average living room. This is tiny. So I am I'm very concerned that we are basically squeezing commercial facilities right out against the wish of the parish council and one assumes the, the the footfall that goes past this area every um day well every school day i've also had quite a lot of uh comments from neighbors of this site uh, over the last two years about overdevelopment of this site if you look at the site there are no gardens they're little tiny flats um, with a car parking space outside. And when you say that Highways has no objections, we have actually at the moment have regular meetings between Highways and Sustrans has done, had to do a whole survey of the area with plans to change all the markings outside because as a school and also the major route out of the village, this is a an area which has a lot of 
parking problems at school drop off and, and pick up time. It can't go 20 miles an hour because it is the main road out. Um, and so I can just foresee this is becoming this has this area seems to have become quite a hot spot. Um, I would have loved the parish council to have argued their own case, but as they have been late, I have to sort of bring on some of their comments and reinforce them back to the committee. Um, it is easy to say that yes, the flat, if it was converted into a flat, then you'll definitely, you know, somebody will take it because premises to live in are in such short supply. But we've got a very overdeveloped restricted site, which is dead opposite a school which has transport and parking issues to the extent that, I mean, we've got Sustrans and highways looking at it in detail. That really concerns me. And the fact that the parish council actually asked for a stop order tends to flag up that they have serious issues. And as I say, I'm in favour of facilities for people who live in villages rather than just more premises to live in, more, more dwellings. Um, I think that's about all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, my next speaker is Robin Cook. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, God, this is golly, this is a um, bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes, I, when I look at it, it's a real balanced one. I, I think from what I read in the report and what we've heard, um, they've tried hard to let those shop premises in the original size and have had no success. But obviously the interest they've had have been for a smaller unit. That's how I read it and hopefully that's correct. Now, with this pandemic uh, that we're still living with, sadly, it has made a sea change in the way that many of us shop and uh, uh, that could have a bearing on take up in the future. I understand the local point of view about having a facility uh, to expand the village retail offer but I'm still not sure whether to have a unit lying empty there is not better to provide additional housing accommodation, which is very much in need, together with a compromise of a yet a small shop. Uh, so I think really, I really understand the local feeling, but I would be happy to support the recommendation. I do, I worry a bit about, although with a smaller shop, it's probably not so much of an issue. The three parking spaces at the front, one there, just for the flat if it goes through i can see all sorts of problems arising from that but um you know that's for another day maybe but i i think a balance to support this because i think it will fill it i think the shop will get used uh taken up fairly quickly and obviously the flat will because it seems the others have been taken up reasonably quickly as well so i'm i'm not putting a recommendation or proposal forward but i'm i'm, I'm happy to support and listen to what other members have got to say thank you Thank you very much, Robin. My next speaker is Shane Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I concur with a lot of what um, Councillor Cook has said. I think it's it's a disappointing situation we're in in these days where um, we are losing retail units on, on our high streets and within our communities. Um, shoppers have moved to a different way of shopping with much of it online. And uh, as Councillor Cook alluded to, the pandemic hasn't helped. I know that there was uh, a, a an attempt to try and get this premises filled while it was a retail out unit uh, during the pandemic period, which wasn't successful. And I think that possibly the compromise is that rather than having it lying empty would be to convert part of it to residential and part of it to still remain as retail. It's not ideal. I'm not particularly happy with it, but I am minded in the reasons for recommendation. The overriding one for me in terms of the officer's report is that there are no material considerations which would warrant a refusal of this application. And I think sometimes in planning, we're not, we're not happy with it, um, but it is law and we have to com conform to it. And so on the basis of that, Madam Chairman, um, reluctantly, I would uh, propose we go with the officer's recommendation as laid out in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Robin Cook who is happy to second, but I do also have two other speakers. Robin, uh, no more debate, but can you just confirm what you've put in the chat bar, please? 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to second. I did say I listened to members debate, but I, I'm happy to second because I think on this one we can we can chew it around, throw it backwards and forwards. But to be honest with you, I think we could come to the same conclusion. And I think Shane uh, has summed up very much my feelings uh, on the matter. So I would be happy to second. OK, thank you. I'm now going to move on to David Took. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm less than content with this. A um, couple of reasons. Um, the parish council make the point uh, that their neighbourhood plan, and I'm very much in favour of listening to both the spirit and the letter of what's in their neighbourhood plan, because that is the way that we make places better to live. And as our portfolio holder for planning, constantly says planning is all about making places better. Um, the, the idea that this can't be a shop or a bigger shop because during a period of lockdown there's been little interest in making it one um, seems to deny the prospects in the future when there will as I understand it be substantially more housing in the very near neighbourhood. Um, and we will all be fully vaccinated and able to, to mingle in the shop more happily, I hope. Um, I, removing the opportunity for the future development of this as, a, as a, a decent sized shop, which is what this proposal does, um, seems to me to be a retrograde step. Um, it, it's just because there have been short term difficulties in letting the shop doesn't mean that those circumstances will continue, especially when we consider the particular circumstances we're under uh, and, and the, the, the development in the local area. So I, I, I don't think this is a good use of the space. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my last speaker is Bill Trite. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Question first, if I may, uh, where does Dorset Council find the uh, what I might describe as the commercial savvy expertise to determine whether or not premises have been adequately fully promoted? Premises like this have been fully promoted or or marketed as is as the term that's wrongly used. Where 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 does that expertise lie, please? And if I may comment on, on the application, um, I, I have quite a bit of sympathy with what the last speaker said and, and indeed what the, the local member said. The, uh, the site, which I'm familiar with, is, is very well located for um, uh, shopping at this location, uh, both now and I think it will be even more so in the future. And as the parish council have said, uh, the COVID crisis has shown how important genuinely local facilities are uh, and a shop unit which has not been diminished in the way that this one is, is going to be or is intended to be. A shop unit which has not been thus diminished is therefore entirely appropriate here in, in my judgment. And we would also be helping promotion of a sustainable community Again, that's been pointed out by the parish council by by not giving our support to this application. So um, I'm afraid I, I do have my doubts about the application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, officers. Can we have a response to the question about expertise to assess the marketing, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, your officers obviously have considered the information that's been provided to them. And in this case, the um, the policy in the neighbourhood plan says that marketing should have occurred for the nine months, um, which has uh, evidence has been provided that that is the case. Um, the question of um, the need for um, additional expertise is one where we take it on a case by case basis and have we considered that additional expertise was required in this case, then obviously we would have looked uh, beyond to uh, the district value and other other sources for assistance. Thank you. Thank you. I've got uh, a question on the marketing. Um, I see that it has been for at least nine months and since January uh, 19. 
the question I would have is the change to the spec of the use class. How much when when that change came in, how far down the road were they with the marketing and what impact will that have made? Because were they marketing it under the old use class or under the new use class? Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe they were marketing it under the old use class. Um, and because it's very confusing, because this application came in before September when the use class is order changed, um, we are required to consider it under the old use class as well, which is class A. Um, but we we know that uh, once the decision is made, then class A is the equivalent to class E now. So um, the marketing was under class A. The application is considered to be a proposal for class A, but with the understanding that um, the intentions of national government is for greater flexibility for these types of units to try and encourage their, their um, sustained use. OK, thank you very much. So I have. Alex, you wish to come back briefly, please. Yes, I do, Chair. On this business of marketing, we have had a slightly unusual year. And I would query that anybody would be particularly interested in um, buying or, or renting a shop in the nine months, including sort of March, April, May, June this year, particularly as the property at that point was not, you know, it was on the plans. It wasn't actually sort of really there, so you couldn't walk into it and have a look. Um, I would love to to suggest, but you'll probably say I can't, that we actually ask for another nine months of marketing. Now it is um, substantially there because the situation is changing. We have another 95 houses going up, not far away. Um, you know, it is a village which is changing. And I just feel if we squeeze this tiny little shop in with a little flat alongside, then in another year, we'll have an application to convert the shop into the, the back end of the flat and we'll have lost it altogether. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, well, we do have uh, a proposal on the table uh, which has been properly proposed and seconded into grant. Um, so I'm not sure that we could actually make that change. If that proposal falls, then you are at, at liberty to come back with a separate proposal. I, I don't think I could take it as an amendment as it's um, been suggested that we grant the application. David Took, very briefly, I don't want to go around everybody again, so you will be my last speaker. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair. I just wanted to, to, to come back to uh, the officer when we're talking about, oh, it's been marketed for nine months and, and that's fine. That's, that's what the neighbourhood plan says in technical terms, but the spirit of it is that it's not to lose local shopping facilities unless it can be demonstrated there is no reasonable prospect of viable continued use and i would suggest that the nine month period just gone has not been a a reasonable demonstration that viable continued use is not possible um, and i i think we need to look at the spirit of the neighborhood plan as well as the technical absolute words of it um, I, I think the two things need to go hand in hand. I just wanted to to make that point clear. Thank you for your uh, indulgence. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd like some officer response to those comments, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, obviously, the policy doesn't make allowance for the difficult period that we've been through recently. Um, we also have the issue that this uh, COVID issue is ongoing and nobody knows when it will change. So um, there is a need to provide certainty for the developer and um, for everybody involved with the development. And in these circumstances, I think it would be difficult to identify or to um, demonstrate that another unknown 
length of time would be necessary in order to meet the requirement of the policy. I'd also respectfully like to point out that although there is a reduction in the size of the shop, it is not proposing to lose the shop. There is still a shop proposed. Um, so um, a reduction, yes, um, but retention of a facility is proposed. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. OK, I'm now going to uh, move to the vote. We have had the uh, recommendation, officer recommendation proposed and seconded. Uh, so I will go through the roll call, please. Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the officer's report and listened fully to the debate and I vote for. Thank you, Alex Brenton. I have listened to the debate um, and I vote against. Okay. Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I followed the uh, full report from the officer and thank you for that and listened to the debate and taking part in the debate and I'm happy to support Grant. Thank you. Mike Dyer. I uh, followed the debate and vote to approve, Chairman. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. I follow the debate and, uh, and the presentation and I vote for. Thank you. Brian Heatley. I've been present throughout and I'm voting for. Thank you. David Morgan. I've heard the debate, Madam Chairman, and I'm voting for. Okay. Judy Robinson. I have followed the debate and I think it's a good compromise, therefore I'm voting for. Thank you. David Took. I've been present throughout, followed the debate and taken part um, and I vote against. Okay. Bill Trite. Thank you Madam Chairman. I've um, listened to the debate and taken into account all the information available and uh, on balance I'm voting against. Okay, thank you. And John Worth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I followed the debate um, and I'm happy to propose accepting this. Thank you. OK. Right, so that is everybody. Uh, David Northover, do you want to give me the outcome of the vote, please? Yes, Chairman. Eight, four, three against. And no abstentions. Yep. So that application is carried. So approval is given as per the officer's recommendation. That is the conclusion of the three planning applications on our agenda. We have agenda item eight, which is appeal summaries. Kim, do you wish to take us through that? By all means, members. Um, the um, We put these um, items on the agenda for members for information because we think that each of the applications has got some interest um, to members. Uh, rather than just to ward members. Um, the first application is um, relates to an appeal for against an outline planning application uh, for a single storey dwelling house at the Boffy at um, 63 Avon Castle, Dashley Heath in Dorset, um, close to the border with Ringwood. The um, appeal was dismissed. Um, site is located outside a settlement boundary within the southeast Dorset Greenbelt an area of outstanding um, uh, of great landscape value and also um, adjacent to the River Avon and there are also trees within the site. The, um, the primary considerations at appeal was whether or not the proposal would be inappropriate development in the Greenbelt um, and also the effect on the character and appearance and also um, the impact on national ecological designations. Um, the River Avon carries several international designations. Um, the, um, in regard to the in Greenbelt, whilst the site is outside um, a village and within the Greenbelt, the, um, the inspector considered um, that the proposal would form um, infill development um, and that it would then meet the exceptions set out in 145E of the MPPF. Um, so on in relation to the um, officer objection to the on the Greenbelt grounds, um, the inspector considered that to be um, acceptable. With regard to the proximity to the um, river, however, um, the um, inspector considered that the potential harm to nature conservation 
notably the issue of phosphates derived from wastewater and those impacts on the River Avon that he didn't consider could be mitigated through condition um, was, um, was, was the reason um, that the inspector considered there'd be conflict with policy ME1 of the um, Christchurch and East Dorset Coast strategy and the appeal was dismissed. We've set it out fuller in the, in the obviously on the, the agenda than my summary here and I'd, um, but it has got implications for other developments in the vicinity of that river. Um, the second um, appeal that we want to bring to your attention concerns um, erection of a dwelling in Dog Dean and unlike the previous application in this instance the inspector considered that the erection of a dwelling in the green belt um, wasn't infilling because um, the site was in open countryside rather than within or immediately adjacent to a village. And, Kim, um, sorry to so, interrupt yeah. you. The PowerPoint is showing the third application. Can we scroll back a little bit, please? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. No, too far. Ah. Page 135. Sorry, I'm reading my notes, not looking at the screen. There you go. Thank you. Um, and and here the um, development was considered to result in an urbanising effect um, and the further reason was that um, Natural England had identified a requirement for a biodiversity plan um, and without one she couldn't conclude there wouldn't be an adverse effect on biodiversity so that appeal was refused on on um, on for two reasons. The, um, the next application that um, is an appeal that was allowed it, relate, it, um, it related to alterations and extensions to a Grade 2 listed building at Sleep Green, Dorchester Road, Lichet Minster. And the application again uh, sits within the green belt, the application site, and the building itself is Grade 2 listed. Um, and the, uh, they were also adjacent listed Cobb Barn, um, some distance from the centre of Lichet. The um, officer's concern was that the uh, application represented disproportionate additions to the original property and that they would harm the character and setting of the list of building. Um, the inspector considered the previous extensions that had been allowed to the dwelling um, were modest. Um, they considered that the cumulative additions wouldn't um, be unacceptable and um, wouldn't would result in little visual change to the listed building um, and therefore consider that the scheme to be appropriate both in Greenbelt terms and in terms of the impact on the heritage asset and that appeal was allowed contrary to um, the officer um, decision. Um, and finally moving on to an application at One Wyatt's Lane in Wareham for a new dwelling that appeal was dismissed um, the application was for a chalet style dwelling um, and it was refused because it was considered that the uh, proposal failed to positively integrate into the surroundings and would harm the Wareham conservation area. Um, and the, in this instance, the inspector agreed uh, and they considered the proposal to result in a prominent structure which would dominate the location at the edge of the conservation area and its design, which incorporated two flat roof dormers would adversely affect the character and appearance of the site and its surroundings um, and it would neither preserve nor enhance the conservation area um, and that appeal was dismissed um, and, and those in summary are, are the appeals we felt that members would benefit from um, having a summary brought to them. Thank you. Thank you very much Kim. Uh, I'm very conscious of the time um, we do have a committee time limit of one o'clock and it's currently 12.57 so can I ask members if you wish to speak to officers on any of the content of the appeals can you speak to officers outside the meeting? Um, the last item on the agenda is urgent items and I'm pleased to tell you that there are none. So with that, thank you all very much for your attendance this morning and your contributions. And uh, I now say that the meeting is closed. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. Chair. Thank you.